Okay, uh, our staff has started recording. Uh, Councillor, you can start any time now. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, good morning and hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Wong Tam, City Councillor. The clerk has confirmed that we do have quorum, and I'll be calling meeting 17 of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee to order. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful uh, summer break. This meeting is being held using the city's WebEx technology with members and staff connecting by video conference or calling in. We ask for your patience with any delays and technical issues. Members of the public can observe the meeting on YouTube. We have also provided captioning for this meeting, and thank you very much to our captioner. There are a few reminders I wanted to provide before we start our proceedings. Staff, please keep your video off until you need to speak or answer questions. This makes it easier for myself as the chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe the meeting. Members and staff, please keep your microphones on mute unless you need to answer a question or to speak. Members, if you wish to speak on an item, if you have your video on and if you are able to, raise your hand or unmute your microphone and let me know and I will create a speakers list. When voting, if you, hear your vid if you have your video on and if you are able to, raise your hand or unmute your microphone to indicate your vote. And if you have any motions on the agenda items, please submit them in writing in advance. The clerk's staff are here to help you. They are available by email. You can send your emails to tac at toronto.ca. Although we're meeting in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd like to begin this meeting by asking if there are any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. And if you have an interest, please unmute your microphone and let me know. Thank you. Seeing none. Next, we need a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting on June the 2nd, 2021. If I can have someone move the minutes. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. I saw your hand go up first. And thank you, Howard. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate your support. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Let's proceed with the agenda. There are seven items, and let's consider the items according to their order. Um, item number one is D17.1, election of the vice chair. We will uh, hold that down because we do have a, a proceeding to go through. Item number two is the chair's update. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, today I'm not going to uh, highlight any of the uh, of the activities. It was just a, a very significant summer break um, for. Uh, if there are any questions of the chair uh, on the chair's report, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, I'll be happy to receive a motion to move to receipt. Okay. I see no one with questions. And Howard, I saw your hand up to move. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Item number three, DI 17.3, update on COVID-19 vaccinations. Uh, we will be holding that down for staff presentations. Item number four, review of the parking and accessible parking requirements for new development. Uh, we will be holding that down for staff presentation. Item number five, digital infrastructure plan and accessible considerations. Again, we have a staff presentation that will be held down for, um, for presentation. Item number six, employment accessibility at the City of Toronto. Uh, once again, there's a staff presentation. We'll be holding that down. Item number seven, Protecting Vulnerable Persons Reducing Homelessness. Uh, this is a letter and a, a set of recommendations from Michael McNeely. Uh, he has asked that we wait until he arrives, and we will address that item when the time comes. Uh, so we'll be holding that down. Moving back to the top of the agenda, uh, the election of the vice chair. In order to elect a vice chair, uh, you'll probably all remember that uh, we had a departure of a recent uh, very valuable member, uh, but now there is a vacancy. Uh, in order to elect this vice chair, we will follow the nomination process. This is very tightly scripted, and we need to follow the process to ensure accountability and transparency. Uh, members, are there any nominations for vice chair? And if you have a nomination, please let us know. Uh, who you are nominating. I would like to provide a nomination from the, 
from uh, my seat as the chair, I'd like to nominate Liv Mendelson. Liv, do you accept the nomination? Uh, sure, thank you. Okay. Happy to. Thank you very much, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, are there any other members uh, who are interested in, uh, I think Wendy just gave you a second to that nomination. Are there any other members who are interested in serving as vice chair? And of course, you'll be serving uh, with Glenn, who is the other vice chair. I'm calling for nominations for vice chair. Any further nominations for vice chair? Calling for a third and final time nomination for vice chair. Any other further nominations? Okay. Hearing no further nominations, I declare that the nominations are now closed. Uh, there is one member and nominee, and uh, Liv is now declared as the vice chair of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Congratulations, Liv. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> we appreciate your ongoing hard work. Um, okay, so we're moving on to item number three. I know this is an item of significant interest for all of us. It's an update on the COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, there is a staff report, as you know. Uh, we are going to welcome Eileen DeViller, the Toronto's good doctor, medical officer of health, to provide us with a presentation on the upcoming uh, vaccination work. Good morning. And my name is Alexa Cattery. I'm an Associate Medical Officer of Health with the City of Toronto, and I'm here presenting on behalf of Dr. Devilla. Is everyone able to see those slides? Uh, yes, the screen is up. Thank you. Great, thank you. And so thank you for the opportunity to provide um, an update. I We'll give a bit of an overview here. So uh, these data were pre um, prepared just before this agenda uh, and the finalization of this information was set. And you can see that as of the 16th of August, um, all residents in Toronto age 12 and over, um, we have some information that indicates that just over 80% had initiated vaccination, so have received one dose of their vaccine and 74.3% and were fully vaccinated. Today, 82% uh, of Toronto residents age 12 and over have initiated vaccination and about 77% have completed their vaccine series. Uh, so that's at the time um, of this presentation. In total, um, in the city of Toronto, we have administered 4.46 million vaccines across um, the entire city. And we're focused on continuing to expand access over a variety of channels. That includes um, mobile capacity and fixed clinics and places where we can bring targeted vaccines to places and people where they are. Uh, we're also working on things like uh, micro-targeting and hyper-local pilots to collaborate with our community ambassadors in an effort to really understand uh, where people need to get their vaccines and, and to work with uh, communities to best understand what kind of vaccination program best suits the needs of the, uh, the people in the places where, um, you know, where we can provide the best possible opportunities for people to continue to get vaccinated so that we can bring that number um, as close to 100% as we can possibly get it. I want to speak specifically to a number of clinics that were held for people with disabilities and their families or caregivers. Uh, there were two clinics held at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre on the 13th and the 19th of May, and then two follow-up clinics on the 8th and 9th of July. Uh, and at those clinics, over 2,000 people were immunized. And these were this was work done in collaboration with the Accessibility Task Force. Uh, and they were uh, specific clinics where people with disabilities were enabled to receive their vaccines in a way that was um, focused uh, on their needs and the needs of their caregivers. And we did do some evaluation of that work. And as we understood it, about 74% of respondents um, 
told us that that was a positive experience and 100% of the people who we surveyed told us that they felt safe at that clinic. And overall, the responses that we received around that clinic were positive. And we've also listened to feedback from the Accessibility Task Force about that clinic and are incorporating that feedback into future planning for clinics and acknowledging that there's always room for improvement about how we do our work and, and thinking about ways that we can ensure adequate notice for clinical services, and make sure that they're open and accessible to as many people as possible, and working on making sure that these clinics are navigatable for everyone who needs to be able to access them. And really working on making this a positive experience for everyone who needs access to these kinds of services. Speaking a little bit to the booking process for vaccines, Toronto Public Health generally uses the provincial booking system. So the booking system that everybody across the province of Ontario is required to use in order to enable people to book vaccines. For this and for those four clinics that I just spoke about, we created a new approach that went over and above what the provincial booking system allows. So the provincial booking system we know is not AODA compliant, and we wanted to prioritize that as something that was important for these clinics. So we made it a priority to simplify and centralize that process for people with disabilities. And that included reorienting the booking system and to make a space for enabling people to input their accommodation needs which was part of the recommendation of the Accessibility Task Force. And, and we really wanted to make sure that that was something that was enabled. And we had just under 150 people request accommodations for the first clinic that was held. And so we understand that that's something that's important to continue to be able to allow for future clinics that we book in this way. We are working to continue to highlight to the province that this is something that and that they need to think about for their own booking system and as a feature for accessibility requirements. But we know that and that it's an ongoing piece of work for us to continue to advocate to the province that a centralized AODA compliant booking system and that includes a form for requesting accommodations is really important and something that and something that needs to be developed at the level of the province so that everybody across Ontario can have access to that same kind of service. May you have the next slide, please? When we think about what clinic locations exist, and the city did establish clinic locations that were meant to be responsive to a variety of needs. And so we wanted to make sure that we had, for instance, sign language interpreters, and, and that was coordinated with support from partners like Rena and the March of Dimes. And we were also made aware that things like designated areas for people who might be unable to wear a mask for whatever reason were important accommodations. And things like private rooms for people who needed specific supports and uh, the ability to lie down or perhaps the ability to move around following their um, administration of a vaccination were important accommodations uh, and that we wanted to limit the number of people on site during those uh, clinics at any given time to avoid overcrowding and were important pieces of accommodation. And um, other specific work that was done included things like having firefighters and paramedics on site to enable work to help people get from the point of drop off into clinics and designating areas for uh, other particular accommodations, having additional chairs in the waiting rooms, being mindful of things like sensory needs. So making sure that there were quiet spaces and having greeters at the doors. We're also working with the accessibility task force and in order to consider what additional or other accommodations might be important for future clinics. So again, always looking for additional or other 
um, accommodation needs and and making sure that any requested accommodations we are able to support where and where those accommodations are reasonable for uh, our clinics or that we're able to connect people to services where and where those services might exist somewhere else. Within our the clinics that the City of Toronto runs, so the city's mass immunization clinics, um, all clinics have parking nearby and have things like um, ramps, elevators, wheelchair accessibility. If clients need, for example, to bring a service animal with them, then those are accommodations that we can make. Um, our clinics have private rooms that are available at the request of somebody uh, at the time of booking or at the time of entry. Uh, and if clients need a particular accommodation, they're able to make that ac uh, accommodation request to a staff member uh, at the point of their arrival or any time when they might be on site. We've also enabled the Accessibility Task Force to present to the Ontario Health Team Engagement Leads, which is a group of our hospital partners, about how to strengthen the services that are were being offered uh, across the city. So at all of the other sites that are not run by the City of Toronto. And, and that presentation was delivered on the 3rd of June, 2021, by the Chair of the Accessibility Task Force, along with represent, uh, representatives from the city. And city staff were also able to provide some updates and share insights from the Accessibility Task Force with the Ontario Health Team Engagement Work Group members to champion some of the recommendations and needs from the learnings that we had um, from the clinics that were run uh, as previously mentioned. There were also some um, training provided for staff at the Toronto Public Health run sites. And so Toronto Public Health provided training for staff in order for um, our own staff to better understand what kinds of accommodation requests and requirements might be made during those disability specific clinics and for clinics um, that might uh, happen in the future. So anytime that somebody might come forward with an accommodation request. Um, the clinic staff met with the Accessibility Task Force to better understand what those needs might be, and then also reviewed an accessibility audit of the vaccine sites, the mobile sites, and pop-up sites in order to uh, gain a good understanding of what the needs would be. And we reviewed resources and tip sheets provided by the Accessibility Task Force to support inclusion and accessibility at the fixed sites. Um, for mo in order to understand what inclu inclusive and accessible service would look like. And there was a training video on how to work with clients who have accommodation requirements. And the Toronto Public Health Accessibility Clinic staff were selected based on their own knowledge and experience, including things like lived experience of disability and those needs. And we do note that our staff had some fairly limited time to prepare for that training. But we've taken that experience in order to develop some really robust training for our, our ongoing work and to make sure that all of the service that's provided on a go forward basis and really gains and benefits from the work that's been done to date. In terms of communication and in accessible formats about vaccination and vaccination resources, the city's website is really the, um, you know, the key resource for information about COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccinations. And the website contains information on accessibility at all city-run clinics, as well as things like transportation options for those who require assistance. And there have been American Sign Language translations posted for key pieces of content. There are videos embedded into the relevant sections of the website, 
Um, and there's also a YouTube playlist of those ASL um, translations. The website is compliant with accessibility guidelines and the Accessibility for Ontario uh, Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And we've worked with the Accessibility Task Force to ensure that and there are ASL and deaf interpreters available when there are um, specific immunization clinics for the disability community. We're also working to um, make sure that things like media briefings have appropriate interpreters uh, and that the balance of our communications are in formats that are accessible. And you know, we're happy to continue to work with the ATF to improve. And if there are suggestions or other um, solutions, then, you know, we are working on actively improving those communications materials and resources to bring them to everybody in a way that's accessible. Alexa, sorry, this is Councillor Wong Tam. Um, I just wanted to let Certainly. you know that you're at 15 minutes. Uh, I apologize I didn't start your, your clock or timer, um, but I did thought wanted to flag oh, that I'm for sorry. you. Thank you. Okay. And I also realize I that you're, you're stepping in for Dr. Davila, who's a, who I understand is accompanying her mom to a, a medical appointment. Um, but, uh, but just to give you that war timing on uh, the warning on the time. Thank you. Thank you kindly. And so I will speak very briefly to in-home vaccination. And we have provided approximately 8,000 people with the opportunity to have their first and second doses through the Homebound Sprint Initiative. And, and we continue to take requests for uh, people to have their vaccine for both first and second doses at home. If there's interest in um, or further questions about the Homebound Initiative, then we encourage people to connect with their primary care provider or to call the Seniors Helpline by phone or to, again, access that information online. And I think maybe we'll move to the next slide because I know that there is um, significant interest in data collection and how we collect data. So the Board of Health did request that the Medical Officer of Health explore additional ways to collect disaggregated data about COVID-19 uh, and the risks uh, for uh, the risks and vaccination rates for people with disabilities in Toronto. We continue to work with and receive data from ICES and for one dose and two dose coverage for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that data gets updated on a monthly basis. The data findings are internal right now, and we're working on ways to share that information more publicly. We're also working on ways to continue to explore with ICES, who are really the experts on collecting and linking this kind of data uh, to better understand how uh, we can uh, explore data for people with other kinds of disabilities. And we're working also on collecting information about self-reported disability on a research project uh, and looking to understand what other sources of information exist and how we can better share that information. In terms of next steps, and. Um, Toronto Public Health and the task force are planning four additional pop-up clinics across the city of Toronto and working to meet people where they are. We're gonna provide additional details about that shortly. And, and we're looking at the first and second week of October with details and, and locations to be determined. And social development and finance and administration staff are also working with the Center for Independent Living and other organizations to support outreach and, and you know, we continue to work with all of these partners in order to support dedicated clinics and to make sure that the rollout really meets people where they are and continues to meet the needs of the, commu uh, of the community. And we want to acknowledge all of these people who have been really instrumental in the development of these dedicated clinics, um, as well as making sure that the, the needs of people are met at the clinics uh, and the mobile sites that exist. We're really thankful for that support, particularly for the support of the task force to support immunization efforts now and on a go forward basis. And, and as Councillor Wong Tam noted, I'm grateful for and 
grateful for the opportunity to present this to you on behalf of Dr. Davila, who is not able to be here today. Alexa, thank you. I think that brings us to the end of your presentation. Is that correct? Okay. We we appreciate you taking the time to to present, and uh, and it sounds to me that you um, you you were probably tossed into the last minute uh, role of presenting. So thank you for making the time for being here. Um, I suspect that there are questions, and I see a hand uh, uh, up already from Michael. Um, can I, I just ask members who have questions to indicate uh, that you have an interest of asking questions, so I can start building the speakers list, uh, starting with Michael Ashley Liv. Okay, Michael, first, go ahead. I'm turning on your clock. Presentation. Um, I would just like to ask you if you can consider um, partnering the Canadian Helen Care Center as one of your partner organizations, because I, I think we need to target deafblind individuals in particular. Um, and to that, I would like to ask if you have thought of any ways to target people who are deafblind. Um, specifically with regards to the vaccine clinics. Very happy to take that back. And um, I guess I just wanted to to ask you if you had if you had implemented any measures specifically for deafblind people. That's my question to you because I, I have to ask a question. So. Um. So the work that we have done to date has been um, for the entire community of people who have disabilities, and that is inclusive of people who are deaf and blind. And I am glad to come back to you with information that is specific to the deaf blind community. And, and I also wonder if there might be some additional information from our community ambassadors around um, whether or not there's been targeted outreach to the deafblind community. And I don't know if my colleagues from SDFA might have some additional information about that. No, thank you. I will, I will come back around when we get to uh, do suggestions to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, next to ask question is Ashley. Uh, wondering, I know uh, to get some clarification on uh, Ashley. The... Just so you know, your your audio is a little bit mumbled. If you can just uh, try to speak into the microphone. Okay, just hang on. Is that a bit better? It is better, but keep uh, raising the volume of your voice if you can. Okay. Uh, just uh, I'm uh, focused on the uh, students who would be high school uh, university. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, I know there was a concern that some university students uh, at, at the different universities used to get their vaccinations on the site of the universities. Uh, with the COVID, uh, the universities are not necessarily all going back. They're digital uh, or virtual rather. So that's a problem. So I'm wondering, is there some sort of a breakdown on the, you know, the high school, uh, you know, uh, university? So that would be probably around like 14 to 21, just roughly. Is there any sort of a breakdown of statistics to find out how uh, we are doing with that group? Because I know that there was some concern about the the uh, vaccination uh, rate for those uh, particular uh, age that particular age groups. Thank you. I don't have that piece of information to hand. Uh, however, we do have information about vaccination by age available on our website. And there will be clinics provided in schools um, or for school age children, uh, both in high schools. And we are also working with um, universities, col uh, colleges, and um, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities to provide vaccination for individuals who are attending school campuses. The Ministry of Colleges and Universities, as of yesterday, has made it a requirement uh, for students who are attending colleges and universities on campus to, to be fully vaccinated and, and for anybody else who is attending a college or a university. And um, so that would include staff, faculty, 
and as well as students. Okay, one additional question, Alexa, following up on that. Therefore, if we look at, uh, you know, two months from now with the new wave, uh, the new variant that is, is upon us at the present time, do you, does the health department monitor, okay, uh, how that particular age group is doing like three months from now with the new variant? Uh, you know, is it going up, going down? Are we at, because when you're telling me the numbers, that gives me the numbers of, of, of the people in that age group, but it doesn't tell me, is that a 10% of that age group, 20% of that age group? You know what I'm saying? So I can understand comparative analysis. That's what I was wondering. Yes, so the, those are all the, all kinds of things that we do try to understand at the local public health units. So we are working to understand, you know, of a certain number of the, say 16 to 20 year olds in our population, how many of them are vaccinated. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Next to ask questions is Liv. Thank you, Ashley, uh, for joining us and for your report. Um, I want to really commend um, our fellow committee member, Wendy Porch, who is the chair of the ATF and has been doing just an absolutely phenomenal job. And also, um, Mini Alaka Tesseri, who is on the call, who's the staff lead um, from the city for that committee. Um, a lot of great work happening there. I do have two questions. I don't think they'll surprise you. Uh, you alluded to them uh, in your report. The first one is about the data collection. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned that we are still at the exploring phase. Um, you know, we're quite far into this pandemic. Um, we've seen the impact that collecting disaggregated data has had on, uh, equity informed approaches to testing vaccination, um, public. Uh, information, so I'm wondering what we can do to, um, what. I'm wondering what TPH can do to move from an exploratory phase into a data collection phase um, in terms of collecting data about people with disabilities who have COVID, who are at risk of getting COVID and who are, have been tested and vaccinated, all of those sort of dimensions. That is my first question. Uh, my second question um, has to do with the in-home um, option. Um, uh, I'm hearing concerns um, that uh, a lot of family doctors aren't aware that this is an option um, and that uh, you can see from the numbers of people who've had in home um, that there may be quite a few more people who would benefit from that option. So my question is um, what kind of public information uh, kind of messaging has gone out about that? Um, and um, my final question is just about um, how you can take this Toronto model um, with the accessibility task force. Um, other jurisdictions are looking at this model with envy and what TPH can do uh, provincially to to um, suggest that this model should be available in in throughout the province. So I'm hitting you with three. My apologies. Certainly no need to apologize. Um, so ICES has provided Toronto Public Health with the data that it is able to collect to date. And we continue to work with that group and around what can be done to expedite the, the kind of data that, it, that they are able to collect. And, and we can certainly continue to advocate to them that they work on that data collection in a a more timely uh, or quicker fashion. And they are the experts in data collection and, and in, uh, in data linkage. Uh, and so, you know, we will continue to work with them in terms of understanding what kind of data they are able to actually um, put together for us and report back and, and continue to advocate to them that they and expedite that work and understanding that, you know, it is important and, and like, we do hear you, like it, um, it's essential to, to move this forward. 
Um, we're Just also clarify, sorry, ICES, it, it looked from your slide like they are collecting information about developmental disabilities specifically. Um, That's correct. That, that leaves out, you know, the rest of, of disability communities. So I just want to note that. Um, does that mean that that data around other disabilities, medical, sensory, uh, physical, et cetera, is not being collected at this time? In a at this point in time, way? at this point in time, it's not being collected in a disaggregated way. And, but we're continuing to ask them to find ways to do that work. Okay, thank you. And we're also continuing to ask the province to um, update their systems in a way that lets us then link that work to, um, to the work that has been done in terms of administering um, COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, the provincial database of who has a COVID-19 vaccine then needs to be linked to um, the database of who has been diagnosed with a, a disability. So those are two um, like two systems that we need to enable to speak to each other. Uh, and we continue to ask the people who hold those pieces of information to allow that work to happen. Coming to your second question, which was on Homebound vaccination, and um, we can uh, we can certainly again take a look at how we've provided the communication around and um, what homebound vaccination and strategies are available. Uh, to date, we've made that information available via our website and via other forms of outreach. Uh, our community ambassadors are aware of and um, that as a method of people being vaccinated and uh, community care providers are also aware that that's an option for their patients um, but again we can uh, you know i can take that back and certainly look at uh, other ways that we can make people aware that that is an option uh, and then finally your last question was on can you remind me <laughs> thanks uh it was about uh, just uh, being able to suggest that the model that's been developed in Toronto be available um, more widely throughout the province. Certainly, and um, and so I, again, I, I am happy to take that away uh, and to consider what kinds of uh, pieces of work we can do to enable the province to, um, you know, to learn and to build on the, you know, like the strengths of the kind of work that's being done here, and. Um, one of the ways that we share information is, um, you know, through regular meetings of the medical officers of health, and that is certainly a, you know, a piece of a piece of good learning and sharing that we could take to that group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liv, for the questions uh, and Ashley for the, uh, sorry, uh, Alexa for the answers. Any other members with questions for our staff here? Okay, Miranda, anyone else? Okay, Miranda, go ahead, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of, uh, in my area, community and employment services, a lot of the feedback we've been getting from persons with disabilities who are our clients are, um, you know, lack of information in terms of, you know, which vaccine that they are getting when uh, it's being administered. Um, and also, uh, for example, um, there's a lot of hesitancy towards that, um, especially if, um, for example, they have um, past histories of allergic reactions, severe allergic reactions to even the simplest medications. So there's the fear of, um, you know, what the vaccine might do um, if they were to take it. I'm just wondering if there's been any um, consideration around that in terms of how um, to proceed in um, handling those sensitive areas. Certainly. So there, there are a number of um, town halls and community presentations that have been made available that discuss the uh, the benefits of vaccination, as well as what the you know the components and how vaccines work are. Uh, those are ongoing and have also been archived on our website for viewing at any point in time. And 
our community ambassadors have also been provided with information and, and they have that kind of information to provide as outreach on an ongoing basis. And we have a vaccine hesitancy working group that's working on uh, providing robust information to people that um, um, that counters kind of fears and hesitancy like this. And um, we have a, um, a place on our website that archives and, and has made available things like infographics and, and information pages uh, that address th this kind of hesitancy. And all of that information is widely available. And I might also ask if Minnie can speak to the kind of information that's available uh, for our ambassadors to do outreach on this kind of uh, topic. Hi, everybody. Absolutely. Um, our ambassadors, as uh, Dr. Uh, Kateri mentioned, are also getting monthly uh, data information and uh, town halls with uh, our doctors to better understand what the hesitancies what the responses could be uh, when they go door to door or meet with residents across Toronto. They also have uh, undertaken extensive training offered by uh, BeWorks Consultancy, which is a, um, uh, a consultancy of behavioral scientists who have uh, created the ambassador uh, handbook that talks about hesitancy, what kinds of, um, you know, the different types of hesitancy and the, and the range of hesitancy and how to speak with people in an empathetic manner to better understand their fears and to be able to answer and support them to uh, get their own answers to, uh, you know, town halls, as Dr. Kateri mentioned, uh, you know, reliable re uh, sources on the website or themselves or doctors. So they're there's a lot of support that our ambassadors, community ambassadors are getting in order to speak with people who are hesitant for various reasons. Uh, I'm not just talking about anti-vaxxers, but also people who have, you know, uh, real questions and concerns about their own health and the impact of the vaccine. So that's, uh, you know, that we're trying to get as much information to the hands of people directly to our ambassadors as possible. And, uh, and we're also, uh, you know, working with uh, with our community agencies to be able to uh, inform their own community constituents who they know well in ways that uh, that are accessible as well. So, you know, we have the communications teams at the city, but we also have an arm of 154 organizations that we work with, and over 200 ambassadors that we work with to be able to connect to, to those who need the information um, in an accessible way. Another element of feedback that we received from our clients was um, in the past that they had no choice in what they were being administered um, for the vaccine and uh, no information was given to them when uh, they were taking the vaccine of which one they were getting. So, um, in an element of um, options for choice, giving them more um, encouragement to take the vaccine and empowerment, I think, um, is also beneficial within the program. Thank you. Thanks, Miranda. Thank you for those uh, suggestions as well. Um, anyone else for questions? Okay, uh, Wendy, go ahead, please. Hi there, thank you Dr. Cotteray for your presentation today. Um, and thanks to Minnie uh, and the SDFA team for all of the hard work that you've all been doing. Um, I just wanted to, um, wanted to ask about uh, whether or not um, the TAC, it's actually more of a question to the TAC, but I'll ask it to you Dr. Cotteray, and then perhaps you could push it back to us. Um, you commented quite clearly in, in your presentation about the accessibility of the uh, Ontario vaccine booking portal and that the Toronto Public Health had to go beyond that in terms of expanding the accessibility of the booking portal. And so I wonder if there's any opportunity um, for us, either as the TAC or the city, uh, to provide uh, a letter or some input to the Ontario Ministry of Health about what has been learned in terms of what's needed around accessibility of booking portals uh, and as a way to encourage them uh, at the province to actually expand the accessibility of the booking portal itself. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind commenting on that. 
you know, I, I think that pretty clearly what we have learned at the city is that the, um, we are bound to use the provincial booking system and the tools that have been provided to us by the province um, and where we hit the limitation of those tools and we have had to uh, we have had to find the means to work around um, those tools because they are not as flexible as we would hope that they could be um, and I think that that has been occasionally a, a challenging experience for us, and, but also an opportunity to, to learn what the needs of our community are. Uh, if there was an opportunity to provide advocacy, I think probably the strongest means to provide that advocacy would be a recommendation through this group, um, likely to the Board of Health and then through the Board of Health to our provincial partners. Thank you. Um, I, I've just actually sent a draft, a possible draft motion over to um, for consideration that would ask uh, the TAC to um, ask for a letter from the city, depending on you know who is most appropriate uh, to go to Ontario, the Ontario Ministry of Health to comment on the accessibility of the booking portal and uh, to recommend an expansion of the accessibility of the of the features there. If Ontarians can't book. Um, the accommodations that they need for vaccinations, that's, that should be of concern to everyone, I think, and it's something that we've certainly learned. Um, so uh, just for my fellow TAC members, I have sent a draft motion over, and maybe Jennifer, you and I can work on it a little bit and uh, present it to everyone. Um, I also just wanted to comment briefly, Michael, uh, can you send on an, a contact for the Helen Keller uh, Foundation? We would love to work with them. We've been working with balance in terms of interveners so far, but I would really prefer to um, make sure that we are connecting everyone that we need to be connected with. So the task force would certainly reach out to them. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, Wendy, thank you. The clerks will be working with you on that motion. So thank you for sending that along. Um, anyone else with questions for Toronto Public Health right now? Um, seeing none, I'm going to take an opportunity, doctor, just to ask a couple questions since we're on the topic of vaccinations. Um, and I'm going to be specifically leaning towards vaccine passports. This has been a, a hot item of discussion over the past few weeks and probably months uh, leading up to this, this particular point in time. The province has just indicated that they intend to introduce the, uh, the vaccine passport. It's going to be a QR code base. I know you may not know all the mechanics around this, but this issue is going to be of great concern for this community, people living with disabilities and those who perhaps um, have medical exemptions and, and others uh, who may not have access to smartphones, uh, digital devices, uh, access to printers with ink and cartridges and, or paper. So I, I want to just understand what can, what can be done at the City of Toronto uh, to enable greater access to uh, equipment so therefore people who do not have equipment can provide proof of vaccination. Uh, and the reason I ask this question is because there will be, uh, I imagine the denial of service to people who are already underserved, people who need access to facilities, who need access to services. And I'm just concerned that there'll be further stigmatization and further barriers for them. I think that's a really uh, fair point and well-made. And again, I, I would strongly recommend that, um, you know, given that this was an announcement made yesterday um, and the province has acknowledged that there's more to come and that this is something that we need to explore really fulsomely um, and that these kinds of recommendations are things that probably yield a lot of strength coming through our um, through our Board of Health report in a couple of weeks. And that report is in development and these kinds of recommendations um, would, um, would have some strength coming through that report. And now is really the time that we should be taking to, um, you know, to make these kinds of recommendations to the province, to talk to the province about what the, the gritty details of this plan are 
given that things like their app are in development now and to be released in October and that you know there is a window of opportunity here to highlight that there are some clear equity gaps that need a provincial solution so that people are not denied access to really essential services. Um, doctor, thank you. And, and I guess a, a little bit further to that, I, I've seen that there is growing anger uh, against those who are unvaccinated. Uh, and I want to just make sure that we're not going to be stigmatizing people who may be vaccine hesitant or vaccine avoidant at this point in time, just because they need further information or just the, the conversation and, and, the, and the ramp up to education um, so that they can have consent over their agency. And, and what, I, what I'm hearing uh, and seeing in, in the media is this, this polarization between those who are vaccinated, those who are unvaccinated. And I don't think that that is ultimately a helpful conversation uh, uh, because um, uh, it, it just, people become very dogmatic and dug in. And at the end of the day, we want science to prevail and we need to be able to meet people where they are, especially those who have traditionally not been well received by the medical system uh, for a whole host of systemic and, and uh, oppression barriers. So I, I guess my question to, to further the, the, the piece around vaccine passports, is there anything that we can do at the City of Toronto to alleviate the, the pressure and the escalation that seems to be coming from this debate. Um, and uh, and I, I, I ask because I'm, I'm, I'm struggling seeing people who are genuinely just concerned about the vaccine, um, trying to do everything they can to protect themselves and their family, and the fact that we haven't been able to sort of get um, to, to the threshold. And that threshold, of course, is making sure that people are safe, right? safe enough with a vaccine or until we have herd immunity, whichever comes first. So is there is there something else that we can do that we haven't done so far to, to bring these two sides closer together? Hmm. It's a good question. I mean, I don't think we're going to unlock 200 years of oppression with a QR code. Um, it's it's much more difficult than that, which I think this group probably well understands far far more than I do. Um, I think what we have learned from, you know, behavioral science and the all of the work that has been done to date understanding vaccine hesitancy that actually long predates COVID is that the the effective strategies to address this are through trust and relationships, which you are correct is not um, is not aided by a pressure cooker um, and so I, you know I think the effective strategies to address this are the the things that we are um, you know slowly and patiently and continuously chipping away at and that is multiple conversations and the training that is being done with the people who are having these conversations to have them in a way that is compassionate and understanding and and meets people where they are and and some acceptance that you know there there will be a group of people who probably are not going to get there and are not going to get there by the date that has been imposed and that's okay and we are going to have to collectively do a lot of work to help people to move in the direction of being vaccinated and not at you know my preferred time scale and that's okay and we're going to have to enable people to move at their own time scale and that's going to have to um you know that's going to have to work that's going to have to be my work to be patient not um, not everybody else's. Uh, doctor, thank you. Um, Liv, you have another question? Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Wontham. Um, just as we turn our attention to the vaccine passports that are, are speedily coming our way, I just want to reflect two of the concerns we're hearing in community and um, to hear um, your uh, perspective. One of the concerns we are hearing um, is that um, 
in order to get a medical exemption, you have to get a, a note from a doctor. And uh, that is a service um, that carries with it a fee and the fees um, are broad, uh, broad spectrum of, of fees that are being charged. Um, and that's a huge uh, barrier for folks. Um, and the other question we're hearing a lot about, and I don't know if, if TPH will have a particular take on this that's different than the province or not, uh, but people are concerned that um, that the exemptions will uh, necessitate disclosing their actual diagnosis rather than just that they have a medical exemption. Um, and that brings with it a whole other um, uh, set of questions. So I just wanted to raise those two issues and to hear your perspective on those. So physician fees are set by the Ontario Medical Association and regulated by the Ministry of Health. And beyond that, I can't really comment. And I, I am aware that the Ontario Medical Association, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and the Ministry of Health are working together to provide my physician colleagues who work and with and who work and provide services to patients in the community on and you know definitions and lists of appropriate conditions for which people could be provided a medical exemption for a vaccine. Um, and that's to be supportive of physicians who are being asked for um, notices of medical exemption. Uh, so that disclosure would happen between a patient and their physician. That disclosure wouldn't happen between um, a, an individual and, for example, a shopkeeper or um, an individual and their employer. It's, I guess, in this intervening period, I mean, we've seen that's the the ideal um until until things are settled there's there's a lot of murkiness but we've seen you know with students who need notes for accommodations etc that often isn't the practice so it might be helpful if tph could um highlight in you know one of their beautiful info communication infographics whatever that 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 information is not required that shopkeepers should not be expecting to see a diagnosis um but merely a note, uh, whatever this notice will look like, whether there'll be a uniform form that is used or whether it's just going to be a prescription pad note, we don't know. Um, but that it might be helpful to communicate um, to those who will be receiving that information what they should and should not be expecting um, on that on that notice. Uh, thank you. I think that was a, a comment more than a question. Is that correct? That was a comment. Okay. I can reframe that. Is that something we can ask you to take back? Let's let's frame it that way. Certainly glad to take that back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Liv. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Um, then moving on to speakers. Um, is Wendy's motion ready? Okay. Okay. Uh, Wendy, keep an eye out for your email. Apparently, there's a draft coming back to you. Uh, any other members with uh, with comments at this point? Anyone to speak? Okay. Uh, Miranda, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, just going further into the conversation of um, medical exemptions. Um, can you speak towards, um, you know, if there are situations where um, there is a medical exemption, especially uh, looking into the employer employee relationship um, within the workplace, um, looking at, you know, vaccination versus rapid testing, um, has that been also included in um, your uh, framework as well? So the the Ministry of oh. I was just going to say, um, Miranda, the, we've we've just concluded questions, so I think um, okay, perhaps what okay. If you Thank can you. If you can reframe that as a statement. I think you're you're telling the the good doctor here that you'd like to see that. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Miranda. Um, I also saw Michael's hand up to speak.
Michael, your, your microphone is still on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hi, can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so I apologize for my theatrics, but I am going to put on a face mask just to demonstrate the difficulty for the deafblind community. Okay. So I think, um, first of all, it's really hard to lip read, to lip read this. It's impossible. So I'm going to ask for uh, um, a suggestion would be that staff use clear face masks in, um, especially when talking to uh, deaf people or to uh, deaf blind individuals. Secondly, I think there's also concerns about putting on the face mask properly. So if I'm blind, I may not be able to tell which side I should be wearing. So I think that should be evident and we should have some protocols in place to assist blind and deaf blind individuals with mask wearing. Secondly, thirdly, um, when you put on your face mask, it it can also cause face blindness or uh, difficulty with recognizing people's faces. So if all of us put on the face mask, I don't think I would be able to tell the fire apart from Wendy. And this can add to anxiety. So I think I think when targeting deaf blind individuals or people with autism or other people that may also have anxiety issues with regards to talking to somebody specifically and not knowing who that person is. I think it's important to talk about clear masks or to talk about people not wearing masks at all, but still engaging in other safety procedures, like maybe behind plexiglass or behind, um, behind some other safety mechanism, because I think those are the people that you're missing when you do these kinds of outreaches for vaccines, because those are the people that are afraid to walk into an area where other people are wearing face masks and where they don't know who they're talking to. And finally, my last suggestion would be that in, in addition to hiring interpreters, you hire interveners. Interveners are those individuals that work with deafblind people. And you can find intervener students at Church Brown College, which may be happy to volunteer. But in any case, I think for any disability related um, vaccine push, there should be interveners present that are able to do um, to hand manual sign language, which includes touching people's hands, touching their bodies, to ensure that their communication is is um, is done effectively. So the, those are the things that I wanted to bring to your attention, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for those comments. Really helpful. Um, anyone else to speak before we move back to Wendy? Okay. Uh, Wendy, if you're ready. Sure. Um, I don't know if there's a way to to display the motion, the draft motion. Yes. Um, yeah, it's coming good. on for you. It's coming on for you. Okay. Brilliant. So, just to say that we're appreciative of the work uh, that Toronto Public Health has done in terms of expanding the accessibility. Uh, of when, the booking portal so that Wendy I apologize for interrupting uh, it's not on the screen as of That's yet okay. but perhaps if you can just take the, a moment to read it we can start there I need to find it in my email then oh, okay on. actually it's coming on the screen there you go okay there it is okay so it's pretty straightforward um, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee recommends that City Council read a letter to the Ontario Ministry of Health to encourage them to expand the accessibility of the Ontario vaccine booking portal directly and to make it possible for disabled Ontarians to be able to book the accommodations they need to be vaccinated. Um, the, as I was saying, Toronto Public Health has done and the city's done significant work on expanding the opportunity to be able to book uh, accommodations when you're booking vaccinations, but um, that's only Toronto. It doesn't. It doesn't uh, apply to everybody, and then it actually is quite frightening to me the number of folks who are probably out there who have not been able to engage with accommodations around vaccination because the booking portal is not uh, doesn't include that and is not accessible. And I think that as the city, the largest city in the province, I think that there is some great opportunity here for um, the city of Toronto to 
display the uh, the progressive work that it's been doing in the area, but also to um, to you know raise the awareness of of the needs of disabled people in this context around vaccinations. Thank you, Wendy. Does that conclude your remarks? It does, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we do have one motion on the screen. Uh, anyone else to speak? Seeing none, I do have a motion as well, if I can ask the clerk to please put it on the screen. Um, my motion is largely related to the vaccine passports to come, and I just want to make sure because our committee will not be meeting again until November, and this will probably be our opportunity to comment on it. Um, my motion will be on the screen, but I'll read it for you. The Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee recommends that City Council request the Medical Officer of Health in consultation with the Toronto Accessibility Advi um, Task Force on COVID-19 vaccines, people with disabilities and other equity deserving groups to ensure that any mandatory vaccination policy or program recognizes legislative and regulatory exemptions or a human rights code related accommodations request for exemption and report back to the next meeting of, the, of TAC on November the 15th, 2021. Uh, recommendation number two is City Council direct the General Manager, Parks Forestry Recreation to make any public printers at community and recreation centers available at no cost to residents to print their provincial vaccine receipts to ensure equitable access. Recommendation number two is City Council request the Toronto Public Library to make any public printers at libraries available at no cost to residents to print their provincial vaccine receipts to ensure equitable access. Um, those, I think the, the, the recommendations are fairly self-explanatory, but I, I, I wanted to highlight again uh, just because I, I think we're going to be having this conversation very soon at the Board of Health, and I wanted to make sure that we can frame the conversation uh, regarding um, access. And, you know, this has been a very trying time. I don't think we need to repeat how difficult it has been for people living with disabilities, people living without homes, uh, people who don't have um, digital devices, whether they be seniors or those who just don't have enough money to pay for the data plans. Um, this is, the society has moved on largely without everybody participating in full civil life. Um, and the, the groups that I've just highlighted are just one snapshot and an example of people who've been left behind. I think that what we want to do is not set up a new requirement to engage in civil life uh, that f puts those individuals further behind. Um, because it's already becoming evidently clear that it's difficult for them to catch up. It is my hope that the province um, gets this right. I know it's going to be very difficult because we've never done it before. And I think that we should give them room to make the mistakes, but also room to quickly correct those mistakes when identified. The province of Ontario will be, will be the fourth province to issue or so have the requirement for a, a, a vaccine passport. So we are certainly not the first one out of the gate, uh, and there are probably some, some best examples that we can already pick up uh, from the other provinces who went ahead of us. So I want to just ensure that everything that we do at the city, um, if there are barriers that are set up at the province, that we try to do uh, further accommodations, provide further accommodations so we can eliminate those barriers. I know it's not going to be perfect, I know it's certainly going to be rife with a lot of my, um, I imagine, quite a bit of tension just because it's another new requirement. Um, but I do think that it's the right thing to do. We can't move ahead without a vaccine passport. But I just want to make sure that when we do this work, that we're doing it with everyone in, in mind. And, uh, and, and I want to just speak about the tensions regarding those who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. Um, we have to be patient. I know that um, you know it, there, there are times where emotions can flare up, uh, and certainly for this committee, um, oftentimes this population is asked to be patient, um, just as much as we need to ensure that people can participate fully uh, in civic life and fully in family and community life. Um, that oftentimes means that we have to make sure that everything is in place uh, in order for people to do that. And the vaccine passport is going to be another one of those tools that will have to be in place and accommodations made to ensure that the vaccines are available, which Toronto Public Health has been doing a stellar job with the guidance of the Vaccine um, Accessibility Task Force. Um, so I know that you know there's a lot of good people working to that outcome, but I also am aware that as we move to those outcomes, sometimes things do fall, do fall through the cracks. And I want to make sure we can do everything we can to try to capture those who are falling through the cracks. 
Um, thank you very much. That concludes my remarks. Uh, are there any questions of the mover? Uh, Uh, thank you. I'm um, sorry. Michael, you have a question for the mover? What would an information add in um, burdens of support persons for those with disabilities, such as interveners, interpreters, and other support staff? Michael, thank you. Um, I didn't catch the first part of your, your comment because you were still on, my, on mute when you started speaking. Would you just mind repeating that one more time for me? I apologize to ask you to do that. No, it's okay. I'm just wondering if we can add in the importance of having support people available for all the interactions regarding people with disabilities. And those support people could be called, you know, um, interveners, interpreters, and other support staff. Yes, thank you. I understand your question a little bit better. Um, where would you suggest that we make that change to the motion? Is it asking City Council to provide um, support people at those locations, or is it to, or or is it a matter that we need to train staff? or at least provide them some guidance when they are inter interacting and providing service to people could with you, disabilities. So could you um, go back to the, can you show me the page again? Can you share the screen? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, if I can just ask the clerk to put the motion back up. Okay. So, in level one, City Council requests the Medical Officer of Health in consultation with the Toronto Accessibility Task Force on COVID-19 vaccines, people with disabilities and other equity deserving groups. I would add, um, with their support persons present, with their support persons present and available. Uh, Michael, thank you. So if I insert the, the words, uh, so right after people with disabilities, if we insert um, support workers, support persons, will that be helpful? And other deserving, equities deserving groups. So therefore the consultation. That would be helpful, yes. Yes, okay. So the consultation will because go to. It's important to underscore the, the necessity of support persons in, in allowing people with disabilities to speak up. Okay, I'm just writing this down, support persons. Okay, so then the motion will read, um, City Council requests the Medical Officer of Health in consultation with the Toronto Accessibility Task Force on COVID-19, uh, people with disabilities, support persons, and other equity deserving groups. Is that satisfactory? Okay, thank you. And did the clerks catch that? Okay. okay, thank you. And thanks, uh, Michael, for working with me on that. The clerks will make that amendment. Thank you. Anyone else with questions of the mover? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Liv, I believe there's a motion that you are working on. Is that ready for Liv? Okay, Liv, your motion is not ready, I apologize. Why don't we... Uh, thank you. Uh, Liv, there's a question from clerk. If you can just, um, can we take down the screen so I can see the, the faces of the members? Thank you. Uh, Liv, there's a question from clerk, uh, and the question is, do you want... Okay. Uh, the question is whether or not you want both parts of the motion or simply the second portion of the motion. If you can just confirm... The second portion... Okay. The second portion is sufficient, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Just give us a minute. Sorry, folks. This is always the virtual meeting experience. And I guess it's probably a good reminder. Please prepare your motions in advance uh, with the clerk. They're always re ready and able to help you. 
Okay, and doctor, thank you for your patience. We're almost there. Um, not a problem. Um, there is a request for us to hold this item down just so that the clerk can uh, speak to staff in consultation with them so that they make sure that they have the, the language of the motion for live uh, properly before us. So if, uh, thank you very much, doctor. Uh, feel free to stay behind. We will be coming back to you very, hopefully very quickly. Um, at this point in time, we'll move on to item number four. Um, and that is the review of parking and accessibility parking requirements for new development uh, something that I'm sure many people have interest in. We'll be receiving a staff presentation from Michael Hain. Uh, Michael, are you here? I right now re you ready to present. Uh, Michael, thank you. You'll have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so I really appreciate the time that you're giving me to present this to you and to get your feedback. I'm Michael Hain. I'm the program manager of transportation planning's policy and analysis unit in the city planning division. To give a bit of background about how parking is regulated at the city. It's dispersed across quite a few different groups. City planning, where I'm from, sets regulations for parking in new development through the official plan and zoning bylaws. Transportation services looks after on street parking, boulevard and front yard parking. Municipal licensing and standards looks after commercial parking lots. Toronto Parking Authority, I'm sure most of you know, look after the Green P parking lots. And Toronto Police Services provides most of the enforcement through the various regulations. There are other groups in the city that also look after parking, like Parks, Forestry and Recreation, which has a, a very large supply of parking at their facilities. But these are the major players. And several of these groups are also working on their own reviews of their regulations related to parking right now. To talk more about city planning's role, the official plan, among other things, aims to reduce auto dependence, and by that I mean the need to use a car to complete your daily activities. It tries to encourage walking, cycling, and transit use, being more environmentally friendly and more space efficient ways for most people to travel. It also aims to limit where parking is located and to minimize parking's impact on surrounding areas. And it requires many types of development to provide adequate on-site or off-street parking. The official plan policies are implemented through zoning bylaws, and in particular, zoning bylaw 569-2013 is the city's harmonized zoning bylaw, which applies to most of the city. It identifies automobile and bicycle parking requirements for new and expanded buildings. The last time that zoning bylaw was amended, it was adopted by council in 2013, and that uh, bylaw was informed by studies that started as early as 2005. So these are quite dated uh, guidelines. And the, the review in 2005 that was used to develop these guidelines was based on the guiding principle that parking zoning standards should require the minimum responsible amount of parking for a given land use. To give you a sense of what the parking requirements look like, this is an excerpt from particularly eating establishments. So this is fairly typical of non-residential parking requirements. You'll see that there are several different policy areas with different parking rates. And generally, there's both a minimum and a maximum parking requirement identified for those. And those rates are based on the gross floor area of the establishment. Similarly, this is a, another example. This is particularly for apartment buildings. And this is fairly typical of residential parking requirements. Again, you'll see that they're based on both policy areas and they identify minimum and maximum. In this particular case, it also, the parking rate depends on the type of unit um, with larger units requiring more parking. Um, and these are based on number of parking spaces per dwelling unit. To explain what those policy areas are, we have a map here. Generally, the policy areas are aligned with the urban structure that's identified on map two in the official plan. Um, policy area one is generally the downtown. Policy area two are generally the centers, so Young and Eglinton, North York Center, Etobicoke Center, and Scarborough Center. Policy area three are generally mixed use areas along the subway lines. 
and policy area four are other mixed use areas in the city. Generally, they're served by frequent surface transit. The accessible parking requirements, uh, the, the current requirement is on the screen. This is more or less in line with the province's integrated accessibility standards regulation, but there are a couple of differences. The current requirements only start when there are five or more parking spaces required on a particular site. And the breaks between the, the rates at which accessible parking have to be provided. In general, uh, the city's requirements start earlier than the provincial requirements. You'll also, you may also know that the, into the provincial requirements identify two different types of accessible parking spots, type one and type two, with type one being able to accommodate uh, accessible vans and type two being more or less the size of a standard parking space. The zoning bylaw only identifies uh, parking space, accessible parking spaces that are equivalent to type one parking spaces. So overall, the city's requirements are generally actually um, much higher than the provincial requirements. There's also a separate section that applies only to medical offices or clinics where the, the rate of accessible parking spaces is higher than for other uses in the city. Through our proposed review, we're using a new guiding principle that parking zoning standards should only allow the maximum amount of parking reasonably required for a given land use, and that minimum should be avoided except where necessary to ensure equitable access. And the purpose of this, uh, there are a few. The, the first is that this will better encourage land and cost efficient forms of development. And this is something that the official plan speaks strongly to, trying to improve the, the and the affordability of housing, among other things. We're also trying, like I said earlier, to encourage transportation alternatives to the automobile. We want to allow for an easier understanding of the zoning bylaw. The zoning bylaw, as it's written right now, is quite complicated. And we would like to simplify that to make people that aren't intimately familiar with the bylaw able to easily understand what it's asking for. And we also want to ensure that there is sufficient parking to meet equity needs. So I'll talk more about how we're planning to do that. Um, so the emerging directions uh, consistent with that guiding principle are that we're planning to eliminate parking minimums citywide, except for a couple of relatively minor, or one relatively minor and one significant uh, case. We're planning to maintain a very low level of parking required in multi-tenant or multi-unit uh, dwelling units, so apartment buildings, multi-tenant buildings, or multi-dwelling unit buildings to serve as the building service and maintenance maintenance sort of requirements. So if you have a plumber or a, a contractor coming to the building, that they will have a place to park their, their vehicle to move materials or tools around. And we also want to maintain the requirement for accessible parking. Since the current formula is based on the minimums and we'd be eliminating the minimums, we have to identify a new way to calculate the accessible parking requirements. We're also proposing to introduce parking maximum citywide these maximums would be set generally at the level of the former minimums for a particular land use in a particular area. There is some adjustment to ensure that there aren't any uses that would end up with a higher maximum than what is currently required. But with that shift of what is currently a minimum to a maximum to maintain the requirement for accessible parking, effectively we can do that by shifting the way the accessible parking regulation is currently written uh, where it's based on the minimums to be based on the maximums. Uh, this particular version of the regulation was written a couple of weeks ago to get the, the presentation in on time, and we've made a couple of tweaks since then, but it's still generally accurate. Um, and we're continuing to work on the, the wording, so your input is really valued. Um, but generally, like I said, the, the language is basically the same. The, the formula for how much parking is required has the same breakpoints between total numbers of parking spots, but instead of being based on the minimum parking requirement, it's based on the maximum. So again, if you have a relatively low number of parking spots, the rate of those parking spots that must be accessible is higher than if you have a relatively large number of parking spots. Uh, this is again the, the general accessible parking regulation, and then there's a separate one that's been altered in a similar way for medical offices and clinics, again, based on the new maximum parking requirements as opposed to the minimums. 
to give you a sense of our next steps, we're planning public consultation in the last week of September, September 27th, 28th, and 29th. We're also reaching out to organizations that support people with disabilities to set up a dedicated meeting to talk more about these accessible parking requirements. And we are planning to come to the Planning and Housing Committee with our final recommendations in November. Um, if you want more information about the project, we have the, the presentations, the recordings with closed captioning from our earlier round of public consultation that would give you more detail about the project on our website, which is www.toronto.ca slash parking review. Um, and I, I'm really interested to get your feedback in particular on the, the regulations as we're planning to rewrite them and any other issues that you have related to parking um, particularly off street or in building type parking, but um, other areas of parking I'm also interested in. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Michael, thank you for your presentation and thank you for making it so uh, succinct. This is very helpful. And you've provided us with a lot of technical information um, and uh, it was circulated. Obviously, the presentation advance is posted online, so the members have had a chance to review it. Are there any questions for the presenter? Okay, uh, Wendy, go ahead, please. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. Um, I, I could just be missing this, but I, I want to ask um, if the minimums are no longer a requirement, but it, the, the bylaws uh, articulated around maximums, uh, where does the mandate for requiring accessible parking go? So is it possible that we would see a reduction in accessible parking spaces if there is no minimum stated in the bylaw? So it, it, having no minimum does open up the potential for a building to provide no parking at all. And the way we've currently written the recommendation, that sort of building wouldn't be required to provide any accessible parking. But as soon as a building provides any parking at all, uh, the way we've written the regulation would require accessible parking as calculated against the maximums allowed, as opposed to how much parking the uh, applicant would desire to provide. Um, so right now, if an applicant was providing one parking spot, according to this regulation, that parking spot would have to be an accessible parking spot. So Can I ask? The other part of your question about whether it's possible to see a reduction in the parking. Um, we've run a, a test against a few sample developments that have come in recently uh, using the old rates, what was ultimately approved and what we're proposing as the new rates. And in general, the new rates would result in a higher number of accessible parking spots than what was ultimately provided. Uh, there were a few examples where it was lower, generally only by a space or two. Um, so uh, less than 10% reduction. In most cases, it was actually an increase by more than a couple of spaces. So we, we think that in general, this would result in more accessible parking in new development. Wendy, do you have a follow-up question? Thank you. I, I, I am trying to just get my head around this. So if you don't mind me asking just another clarifying question. So. What, what you're saying is if there is a, a development and there's a mandate, there is a, if a building provides one parking space, they have sort of opted into providing parking and that parking space would then have to be an accessible parking space. Is that correct? The way that the regulation is currently written, that's correct, yeah. And for places that currently provide parking, and have a certain amount of accessible parking spaces. Uh, does this bylaw apply? So can they can they then decide uh, we're no longer mandated for minimums? Um, so we're going to get rid of all of our parking. Is that a possibility too? Uh, right now, no. Uh, existing parking, what we call lawfully existing parking, uh, right now under the zoning bylaw can't be removed um, without a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, so if there is accessible parking now, it would not be able to be removed. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you answering my question so clearly. You're welcome. Uh, live to ask questions. Hi, 
I, I actually don't have a question. I, I apologize. I thought you did. I apologize. Um, anyone else for questions of Michael? Uh, Miranda, please. Go ahead, Miranda. Hi, sorry, I'm just trying to fully understand this myself. So with these maximum um, accessible parking spaces, are there um, fees applied to them now? Is that correct? Uh, um, it's a fair question. The, the zoning bylaw doesn't speak to pricing of parking um, in any way. At one time, there was a, a regulation that was put in that visitor parking had to be free. Um, but that was removed by the at the time, the, the LPAT, the Land Planning Appeals Tribunal. So there, there isn't anything in the zoning bylaw right now that speaks to uh, the pricing of parking. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for questions? Uh, Michael, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions regarding on-street parking uh, and those displaying the disability plates. Um, Obviously, the, the changes that you're proposing is going to have um, a significant effect on the bottom line of the developer, because we're talking about new development. Um, and I think that some of the pressures that we've seen, especially in areas that have seen already, just example in the West Donlands, where we've seen a reduction of um, on-site parking uh, required by developers and new development, uh, create an unintended consequence of having a lot of people then than wanting on-street permit parking and, and not having then sufficient spaces to accommodate them, uh, which then has another effect of those who are coming into the area uh, who, have, who are using um, uh, disability uh, uh, vehicle plates, uh, then not having spaces to park. Um, so with respect to this particular move um, from, your, from your division, and I recognize why you want to reduce automobile use, um, has anyone done modeling with respect to development coming through the pipeline where you anticipate people to have cars? Um, because the first, the first round of investor buyers may not have the vehicle, but the, the occupant, meaning the tenant or the, or the second buyer, uh, sometimes does require a vehicle. Um, and so we're, we're seeing these sort of um, parking wars in different neighborhoods where we've seen a lot of intensification. Has anyone done the modeling in your shop to forecast that this is not going to have an unintended consequence? Uh, that's a, a really interesting idea. We generally don't model parking demand at all, um, but that's something that we could look at in the future. Michael, I would suggest that you do that because you're you're asking. For, I mean, you're obviously there's some big uh, zoning changes and and requirements coming down the pipeline, and I think that in order for us to not be so idealistic that we assume that everyone's not going to be driving a car in the future, because uh, I think there are still people who are re relying on automobiles, uh, we don't necessarily want to create an environment that's unlivable. So therefore, we definitely want to see the reduction of vehicle use. I, there's no arguments there. Uh, that is not sustainable, especially for urban life. But at the same time, in the, in the interim, we can't be making big changes in parking requirements and not expecting that people were, are, are going to basically go car free, especially in areas that are new with um, uh, intensification, but it's still a transit desert. So therefore, transit is not readily accessible, it's not reliable, it's, um, it's, it's inadequate, and, and then you're asking people to sort of get around. Um, and for those who are perhaps pushing strollers, carrying heavy parcels, um, and work is not a, 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 a 15 or 25 minute walk, uh, they're probably gonna have to take transit. If transit is not available, then they're gonna be forced to drive. Uh, and if the, if the driving is, uh, there's no place for them to park their cars, then we spend a lot of time talking about parking, which is, <laughs> which as a counselor, is the last thing you wanna talk about. Um, so I just wanna put that, I, I'm just gonna, suggest that if you, if before you go to planning and housing, because I know you're, you're heading that direction and you're going to consultation, um, someone's got to do the, the forecasting. And, uh, and, and the, the, my, my question is, um, will you have forecast and modeling done before you make final recommendations to committee and council? Uh, we will see what we can do on that. 
I do want to point out a couple of other things that I didn't mention in our presentation in the interest of time. That the the rates that we're seeing for um, car ownership in the city are declining, um, and it, it's something that we want to continue to support. The the idea of removing a minimum parking requirement is not the same as removing parking. When other municipalities have done this, uh, generally the parking rate um, relative to what was provided previously or required previously declines slightly, but not in a, a significant way. Uh, the, a, the example that we used most often was in London, UK. The amount of parking that developers provided after their minimum parking requirements were removed was a, a drop. I believe it was in the order of 30%. Um, but the interesting thing is that the rate that developers provided after the parking minimums were removed is generally the same as what is provided in Toronto now, even with parking minimums. So the, we would expect a decline uh, to some extent in the parking that's provided in a de new development, but we wouldn't expect a significant decline. Um, the other point that I meant to mention is that although there are parking requirements now, Generally, large developments come in and ask for uh, variations on the parking requirements, and generally they're they're uh, granted. So the the large developments that come in now are very rarely actually consistent, providing an amount of parking that's consistent with what the zoning bylaw requires now. Uh, I believe it's on the order of seventy five percent of large developments that are. Uh, providing less parking than what is technically required by the, the current zoning bylaw. Um, so part of this change is just recognizing behavior that's already going on in the city. Michael, thank you. Uh, Liv, to ask questions? So I'm just wondering how these changes, um, how these changes work, I guess, with the new design of public spaces and um, within the AODA framework. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, can you expand a little bit on what you mean by design of public spaces? Oh, okay, we're getting into the weeds here. Well, but oh, maybe I'll, I'll clarify I, why I'm asking yeah, that. Yeah. Our, our bylaw applies only to the off-street on-site parking. Um, so there are requirements in the zoning bylaw that speak to the dimensions of the, the parking spaces and how big they need to be. Um, but this particular review isn't looking at anything off-site. My understanding with the design of public spaces is that it's about the total number of spaces. Um, that's how they calculate things, and you're going to be changing that potentially by reducing number of spaces. Um, so I'm just wondering how that works. So the what we're proposing here is that currently there's a requirement for how many parking spaces have to be provided based on the, the nature of the development. For non-residential, it's based on just the area of the development. For residential, it's based on the number of dwelling units. What we're proposing is to remove those minimum requirements, recognizing that the, the current requirements are much higher than what is really required and shifting the burden of determining the appropriate amount of parking spaces from the city to the individual developers. The individual developers know the market that they're trying to sell to much better than the city. There's a lot of variation within a particular type of development uh, in terms of how much parking is demanded. And uh, just generally, that variation is better accounted for by the individual developers than by the city. Maybe I'm confused, it's very possible, but my understanding is that the design of public spaces speaks to the number of, of parking spaces um, that's required. That's that's one of the things that it covers. Am I am I incorrect there? Um, like the, the zoning bylaw speaks right now to how many parking spaces are required, but it, it does that in in built developments themselves, so new and expanded developments. It, it sounds like you're talking about on street parking, or um, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're asking. I'm sorry. Okay, um, I think I I will I will come back to that. Thank you. I'm going to just um, that's that's helpful for now. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. Anyone else to ask questions? Otherwise, we move right into speaking. Okay, um, to speak. Uh, Liv, I'm going to just take the opportunity to speak first. I don't see any other hands up. I, I want to give you a chance to regroup because I think I know where you're going with, with, your, with your comments. Um, so, Michael, thank you very much for your presentation, and I recognize that this body of work is going to uh, be one that ignites a lot of discussion, because uh, there's oftentimes, in theory, uh, there's the, then, then there's the practice. And, and I want to just offer you a few observations um, as, a, as a resident in the downtown core, as someone who works in, in government, trying to facilitate the, the different needs of, of our communities. Um, my observations is that as we reduce the requirement for parking for new development, and certainly there's a business case to be made for developers because they're saying it's too costly for them to build, and at the same time it meets our climate positivity goals of trying to promote transit, active transportation, and the reduction in the reliance on automobile use. So those two seem to line up. Developers want to build less, city wants you to, to get out of cars. The challenge that I am seeing is that new developments don't service themselves well. So you have a lot of intensification coming down into a neighborhood. There are parcels and delivery trucks and people coming and going. And, uh, and that's good because that d indicates that you have a vibrant city and, uh, and that there's lots of activity. And that usually tells you, at least um, on the pro prosperity index, is that things are being moved around, goods and services. Those are all positive things, eyes on the street, all fantastic. The outcome, I think, that I am observing is that it puts a lot more pressure on public spaces. So therefore, we are seeing a real high demand of residents who live in high-rise buildings who, were, um, who are not being accommodated in the building for on street, for, for in, on on-site parking, who is now pushing the pressure onto the public realm. So public spaces are now being commodified. So as we have on-street parking, and it's a permitted use, it's designed to allow for those who have no other option of parking. Therefore, we will give you a space on the street to park. Now you put the vehicles for service there, whether it's your FedEx, a postal coats, or uh, sorry, a Canada Post, or whatever else, delivery truck. Uh, then you've got your wheel trans, and you've got your buses. Uh, it becomes a bit of a, a congestion zone, just because that the law of physics says you can't put more on there. Now I don't get wider sidewalks. So my sidewalks don't get to be widened, even though I've got thousands more residents moving in the core of the city or, or in any population that's seeing intensification because we have so much pressure on the roads. I can't put in bike lanes because the bike lanes are now uh, seen as an, a further encumbrance to, uh, to traffic. Uh, and, and of course, traffic is you know, leading to congestion. So I guess what I'd like transportation planning to think of is to, to think of the think about this policy at, as it's in development in, in, in conjunction to everything else that's already there. So we need to make some decisions as, as, a, as a big city and a growing metropolis on where our priorities are. I'd like to think that the first thing we can do is shift everything back onto the building. So therefore, if there's new intensification, that building should in be able to entirely service itself. And that means you have adequate loading and servicing bays and, and all those other infrastructure that's needed in order for that, for that, fun that building to function well. That does relieve a lot of the pressure on the sidewalks and the city streets. So we don't need to have this constant war and tussle on how to share the road and the sidewalks. So to, to Liv's point, and, and, I, and I think that she had a really great point that she was getting to, is that if we're going to make this dramatic shift, and I, and I do support it, there has to be a push back to the developers that they have to provide all adequate servicing on site. And if that means that they need to provide 100 visitor parking spaces for a building that has 600 people to accommodate the vehicles of service, delivery and otherwise, visitors and tradespeople coming to the building, uh, and anyone else who's requiring um, access to the building, including those with disabilities, that goes entirely back into the building and off the public realm. And the public realm, I would include the curb lanes, which we've always um, readily given over to park vehicles. Um, so I, I, that is always a tussle at every development meeting I've ever been to. And somehow we're giving the developers exactly what they want, which is less parking 
because it meets the objective of, of climate positive city, but we're not forcing them to do the other thing, which is provide entire servicing on site and having no um, pressures on the, uh, on the roadways. Uh, thank you. Liv, are you ready? Go ahead, please. I, I, I just again, um, just looking at the design of public spaces again, so new developments require the total number of, of, of spaces and some of those have to be accessible. We, we understand this. My understanding is that the design of public spaces covers the total number of accessible spaces. Um, so that's the question I have is how those two things will, will interact. Um, Um, I guess my confusion is around what you're including when you say the public spaces. Are you, are you talking about the space on street? My understanding, and perhaps it's not fully uh, formed here, what, was that the design of public spaces um, covered beyond just the on street. Like it, it has to do with the total number of accessible spaces available. Um, but that's something maybe uh, we can connect about offline. I don't want to derail um, the meeting on this this one point. Yeah. So if, if if your core question is about the amount of accessible parking required in new developments, then the zoning bylaw covers that, and that's the the proposal. Um, can't remember if it's still on the screen. I, get, I do get that. that. I the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. I. Um, I may connect with you offline. Thank you. Yes, please do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liv. Anyone else to speak? Liv, uh, Wendy, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think we can see here in the engagement that we've had with you so far, Michael, that this is a bit confusing for folks, I think. Uh, and, you know, I think we're also talking about different pieces of legislation and how they fit together or don't and what we understand by particular terminology. And I did understand from your presentation that you are moving into a consultation phase that would include connecting with uh, disabled people's organizations and with the community too. And I guess I would just recommend that, um, you know, in particular, you referred to modeling that that demonstrates that the overall number of accessible parking spaces would increase and uh, that you take that modeling information with you to those consultations and, and provide it in a transparent uh, fashion. I know we, we've just heard about it in passing here, but I certainly can tell you that when you're talking to the community at large, and certainly if you're facilitating those um, consultations through disabled folks uh, organizations, that that question is going to be one of the key questions uh, because this community feels a little bit left out of most things. And the, the specter of potentially having even less opportunity to park uh, and to get around in a way that um, is meaningful will be a concern. And so my recommendation is um, that that information comes uh, with you to those presentations and that it becomes clear for people how you have calculated and modeled that there will not be a reduction in those accessible parking spaces because um, we're not going to be the last people to ask that question, I guess is what I'm saying. So. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have that with us for those meetings. Thanks, Liv. Thanks, Michael. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Uh, then with that, we want to just say thank you uh, to you, Michael, for your presentation. Uh, we know that you've got a lot of work ahead, including consultations with the community uh, broader and, and uh, outside. Uh, we look forward to seeing this work as it develops, and I will look forward to welcoming it at Planning and Housing Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Okay, everyone. We're heading back to item number three. There is uh, another motion from Liv, and it is now ready. The clerks can put this back onto the screen for you, Liv. Oh, sorry, I'm moving too quickly. Okay, okay here it goes. Go ahead. Oh, it's not ready. Okay, it's ready. Uh, Liv, if you want to speak and move your motion, please.
So uh, the motion is that the program manager accessibility unit invite representatives from the Institute for Clinical Evaluation Evalu Evaluative Sciences, ISIS, to give a presentation or to provide a report to the TAC on the challenges of disaggregated data for people with disabilities and COVID-19 infection and vaccination rates to date, including issues in collecting the data and what can be done to expedite the collection of disaggregated data similar to other jurisdictions. Thank you, Liv. Uh, did you want to speak to it further or? It's self-explanatory? Uh, no, in the interest of time, I think it's, it's hopefully oh. clear. Okay, thank you. It is very clear. Thank you. And thank you to the clerks for working on that. So there are three motions before us uh, on item number three. Um, we don't need to go back and review them all, I don't believe. They're on the screen. They've been presented and they've been spoken to. Uh, would it be okay if we took them as a package and voted on them all together? Yes? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the package of motions? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much, everyone. And I want to welcome Jason. Jason, you've called in. It's great to have you here on, on the call. I'm sorry that we, we cannot uh, see you on the screen, but I know that you have some very exciting news and an excellent reason for, for, uh, for being late. Um, we missed you at our June meeting, and I just want to say congratulations on the birth of your son, Christian. Um, congratulations to you and your partner. If you can't, if you can't see the, uh, if, actually, the members on the screen are waving their hands, so they're, they're giving you big, enthusiastic love and thumbs up. It's all virtual. I wish we were together. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we are heading on to item number five, uh, digital infrastructure plan and accessibility considerations. Uh, we do have a presentation from the manager of Connected Community and the management consultant of technology services. We welcome to you to our committee and you have 10 minutes. The screen is uh, yours and the floor to speak. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for... Uh for this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I wonder if, um, Hamish, would you mind putting the presentation up? Um, I, I, I do apologize, my WebEx is lagging a little bit and I... I, um, I don't have the share um, option activated. Oh, there we go. Okay, one moment, please. Are we giving sharing to Hamish? Oh. There you go, Hamish. It's coming on the screen. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> I had the sharing power and I, I didn't realize that. Okay, so Hamish now has the sharing power. Um, so again, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, the goal of the presentation is to provide you an overview of the digital infrastructure plan. Um, and then we will talk about why we believe this work is important to Toronto residents, businesses and visitors and what it encompasses and what is needed to move it forward with creating and applying it to city operations. Um, so. You know, over the next 20 slides or so, we will talk about, um, you know, the digital infrastructure plan, um, specifically the accessibility policies in the digital infrastructure plan, as well as giving you an overview of the upcoming consultations uh, with, with the members of the public. Again, we are very grateful for this opportunity uh, to speak with you and we look forward to the discussion and um, hearing your feedback on this work. Um, uh, as you heard, Councillor Wontam introduce uh, the team. We are the Connected Community Team, or some members of the Connected Community Team, and we are situated in the Technology Services Division. And uh, we've shifted our name from uh, Smart City to the Connected Community Concept in 2019, after working together with over 20 city divisions, really to define on, you know, what is the focus of this work? Um, you know, beyond the technology that you might associate with Smart Smart City, our team's goal, the Connected Community Team's goal, is to empower Toronto to use processes, um, you know, tools, data, and technology, of course, to optimize resources and enhance the quality, accessibility, and performance of our services, um, increase economic competitiveness, and to engage residents, businesses, and visitors more effectively. So, in other words, the Connected Community 
uh, work is about using digital infrastructure better to improve the quality of life for um, Torontonians through social, economic, and environmental means. And so, you know, when we talk about digital infrastructure, what does that mean? So it's important that we have a shared understanding of, uh, of digital infrastructure. Um, so, you know, what does it look like? How does it relate to the overall digital infrastructure plan? Um, so in defining digital infrastructure, we've taken a, a pretty broad approach uh, in defining it, as you can see on the screen here. Um, and so we we really are looking at it as anything, as the infrastructure that creates, exchanges, or uses data or information as part of its operation. And, and again, that's quite broad, um, but from a resident perspective, maybe it's interacting or, um, you know, benefiting from the city's digital infrastructure um, in a number of ways, such as, you know, accessing information from the city's website, right? Um, maybe um, being able to view sessions like this through, through YouTube, um, using a chatbot, um, paying for services online, uh, or maybe using automated meters to monitor water usage, which is why we included that image. Um, and also there are, you know, things like sensors um, and other um, data collecting devices to improve to improve road safety. Um, and so we are doing this work because we believe that digital infrastructure is changing the way that we deliver municipal services. Um, and that can lead to a number of positive outcomes and better management of our assets. So as the use of digital infrastructure increases, uh, we are developing this plan. Uh, digital infrastructure plan is quite long, so we call it the DIP or the DIP uh, often. Um, so the DIP is intended to guide the day-to-day -day and long-term uh, planning for staff like, and like Hamish and myself. Um, so in other words, the DIP is intended to shape the kind of digital city that we're trying to build for all Torontonians. Um, like the item just before ours uh, from city planning, the digital infrastructure plan is will shape our digital city through consultation, which we'll talk a little bit about, policy development, implementation, evaluation. We understand and recognize that there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to this realm. So the digital infrastructure plan is also intended to help bring clarity and certainty for our residents and, and, and stakeholders. It's a place where we can address gaps and issues, as well as increasing the city's well-being overall through opportunities. Um, so with that context set, I'd like to um, introduce um, my colleague Hamish, uh, who is uh, one of my colleagues who's leading this work along with uh, Nabil um, Ahmed. So over to you, Hamish. Thanks, Alice, and good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having us again. <clears throat> so, um, you know what, I'm just going to back up again because this slide um, about digital infrastructure is key. This is the, the, the definition that Alice just went over. Um, we're from technology services, again, talking about technology, but um, digital infrastructure um, is broader than just technology, such as, you know, computers and laptops. Um, it includes data and data standards and protocols, which is why we use the term digital infrastructure. So that's an important thing just to uh, to be aware of. It's it's more than just, um, you know, like a phone you might hold in your hand or a laptop. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly go on to talk about the digital infrastructure plan. Um, I think the um, the point Alice just made about um, the work that city planning's doing on the zoning bylaw and, and the official plan is is key. So the, the, the digital infrastructure plan, it, it might be helpful for you to think about it in, in a similar sense where it's a plan that will help guide decision making um, that's related to the use of digital infrastructure in the digital realm as opposed to the physical realm. So the sorts of things we're thinking about as we do this work are, um, you know, digital rights, access and equity considerations. What does the collection of, of data mean for, for youth, for example? How do we protect that? How do we ensure privacy? When, when should we involve the public in the same way that, uh, you know, the public should be involved in consultations around parking standards? Um, they should also be 
perhaps involved in conversations around uh, digital infrastructure. And so what are those thresholds? Um, obviously, there's a need for formalized governance to help inform those sorts of conversations. So those are some of the, the opportunities and challenges in terms of context setting. A lot of work has been done at the back end related to the DIP, um, starting um, about a year and a half ago, City Council approved five principles, the first five there that are numbered, and I'll go into these in more detail shortly. There is a sixth one, um, uh, digital autonomy, that we're, we've also folded in as directed by City Council as well. <clears throat> So I'm going to take some time now just in the next few slides to dive deeper into each of these principles to help you understand their intent and, and how they all relate. So starting with digi sorry, starting with equity and inclusion, the, the, uh, the text on the slide uh, in these, this slide and the following slides are the vision statements that have been approved by, by City Council. And so these are um, sort of the, the overarching um, vision for, for what these themes are about. So it says digital infrastructure will be used to create and sustain equity, inclusion, accessibility, and human rights in operations and outcomes. So this principle is, is meant to describe how Toronto will ensure that people can enjoy their rights and freedoms and feel safe and secure online when accessing city services and products and services they interact with or choose to use. The next principle is a well-run city, and, and this principle is meant to describe how digital infrastructure can be used to enable better outcomes for, for the city through such means as evidence-based decision-making and more efficient allocation of resources or management of, of assets. And, and, you know, just thinking back to that, to that image of the, the water, uh, the water leakage and the use of sensors to help with that. Um, the third principle is social, economic, and environmental benefits. And the focus of this principle is on leveraging digital infrastructure to create a society or a city that supports equitable and inclusive benefits, whether for social, health, economic, or environmental prosperity. <clears throat> the fourth principle of the DIP is privacy and security. And this principle recognizes that with the increasing move towards digital in and digital transformation, um, Toronto's digital infrastructure must be positioned to address things like potential um, cyber attacks and dis disruption of critical systems, but also potential privacy and security risks um, and issues to individuals. <clears throat> the fifth principle is democracy and transparency. Um, this principle recognizes the city's role in building trust in digital services and infrastructure that supports our community. And this can be done in, in a, a number of ways, such as by ensuring that human rights principles of privacy, freedom of expression, and democracy are incorporated, um, sorry, are incorporated into the city's digital infrastructure. And the last um, or the sixth principle is digital autonomy. Um, it's it's a it's a complex um, concept, but essentially autonomy itself refers to the state of being self-governing, and and so this implies a level of control and independence. So thinking about that in the context of the city or the local government level, and folding in technology, this principle is about the city's ability to control the selection, use, and design of its digital infrastructure. Um, and, and this can take shape in a number of ways so that we've explored, but some examples include the right to repair. So that means the city would have control over the right to repair its own digital infrastructure as opposed to relying on uh, vendors um, to do it, um, which, which is sometimes the case through, through, um, through contractual um, uh, means. Um, and, and another part of autonomy, and there's many there's many parts to it. We can get into it if there's interest in a discussion. But another another aspect we're looking into is also ensuring that the Toronto Public Service itself has the skills to address and accommodate the various digital rights issues that are emerging. <clears throat> this is just a repeat of the equity and inclusion uh, principle, which I, I I went through before. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the time, so I'm going to uh, keep going. Um, Okay, so um, the way we are building out the digital infrastructure plan, again, it's a policy document. Um, we have a chapter for each of those six principles and within each chapter we've identified policy, sta policy statements which identify themselves 
how the city will address each of those very, very kind of complicated but critical issues that, are, that I just walked through in, in those principles. Um, so, so I don't have time to go through all of these in detail, and, and I, um, I, I, I understand you've been circulated these slides in advance, so hopefully um, you've had time to, to look at them, and we can come back to them again if there is time in the discussion. Um, but again, th there's, there's different, a number of different uh, policy areas of focus, including equity, inclusion, and human rights. We have identified a number of policy statements. One that is key, um, we've identified it as being a, a digital equity policy um, to address things like digital exclusion or the digital divide, where issues of accessibility to the internet, affordability of the internet are, are key. Also, digital literacy, and uh, access to devices and even knowing how to use the internet itself, all those things are interrelated that uh, are, are, are front and center, particularly during the COVID pandemic, which has highlighted all these issues. Those will be examined as part of the digital equity policy. Um, and then obviously digital, uh, the accessibility of digital infrastructure itself. Uh, we've identified a number of um, policy statements there to advance that. Um, that aspect to ensure compliance with the AODA. And then responsive digital infrastructure to make sure that digital infrastructure works for everybody who's using it, not just not just um, you know a certain demographic. Uh, I've mentioned the digital divide already. We've we've done some research work already. I'm going to skip get, uh, skip this slide in the interest of time. Um, <clears throat> In terms of um, next steps or, or the, the input we've obtained so far, um, we've done a number of cons consultations internal and are, are launching to a series of public consultations, which I'll talk about shortly. In fact, on this slide, um, this is just a timeline of where things are at. The gold star shows generally where we're at in terms of the timeline. We've done a lot of work to get up to this point. We have some public consultations uh, that are shortly starting. And that work at that consultation will be used to inform a staff report and um, development of the DIP itself to a committee at the end of the year. Um, so just a little bit more details about that, uh, that work um, on this slide. Again, I, I won't go into the details. We can answer that if there's any questions in the discussion itself. And as part of that discussion, we're looking um, for advice, if you, if you um, have any thoughts on how we can build upon the policy statements provided under the policy area of equity, inclusion, and human rights, um, or the accessible digital infrastructure um, policy area um, related to digital equity. Um, I, I, I very high level went through some of the issues there. Do you have any thoughts on um, other aspects that, of interest um, from your perspectives? And also, as part of our consultation work, um, are there any key groups or organizations that you think we should meet with to carry out this important work? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there and hand it back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, Hamish, thank you very much for your presentation and Alex uh, for yours as well. Um, this was very, very full. I know that it's very dense stuff um, and obviously a, a body of work that's just emerging in some ways. Um, so I'm just turning over to the committees. Are there any questions of the staff? Starting with Wendy and then Ashley. Wendy first, go ahead. Hi there, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my my question relates to something that's not mentioned. So maybe it addresses my question addresses some of your questions, perhaps. Um, the some of the mechanisms that you're talking about, like sensors and sort of you know digital provision of of services, all of them in fact provide the opportunity to collect data, and they all provide an opportunity to potentially use artificial intelligence in terms of how you. Uh, the decisions that you make uh, out of using that data and out of collecting that data. And I just wondered whether or not you could speak to any of the thinking around artificial intelligence in terms of the of the developed plan to date. Um, thank you, Wendy, for the question. I'll start and maybe I'll move over to my, my colleagues and if they have any other comments. Um, artificial intelligence is, is definitely an area where a lot of people are looking for um, 
efficiencies or um, or improvement of services, um, it can give uh, more insights uh, to help us make better decisions. But we also have to be um, very, very careful about how we use um, artificial intelligence because we know that uh, there are biases in in data that we already have, as well as um, there could be um, algorithmic algorithmic bias in the way that we apply the data. So to that end, we do have work planned uh, starting very soon, focused on creating um, a process where we mitigate that as much as possible. Um, we also have the pleasure of working with um, other groups on the data for equity um, policy as well to ensure that um, artificial intelligence is applied um, uh, in, a, in an equitable and safe way here at the city. I'll hand it over to, to Hamish or Nabil if you have any comments. Um, just quickly um, to build on that, Alice, um, one of the, the items of work we've identified that's important, we think is being important is to uh, have a public registry um, of artif artificial intelligence um, systems that are used so that people can, you know, as part of the democracy and transparency principle, people can have insight into if they're interested in this sort of thing, um, how AI is used at the city and the types of algorithms that are that are informing those to, that decision um, tree as part of that process. Okay. Any follow up questions? Thank you. No, I, I will. Uh, I have some comments, but that's it in terms of my. Okay, questions. thank you, uh, Liv. I do see your hand up, so we'll acknowledge you after Ashley. Ashley, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone is concerned about their personal data. Certainly there's been uh, some challenges for governments at the city level and at the uh, state level as well, as well as large corporations, of course, that have got our data through our credit cards and through our personal uh, documents, uh, birth certificates, driver's license, et cetera. So my question is, given the fact that there has been evidence and there has been uh, experiences for cities, I'm thinking of Baltimore for one, but there are many, uh, whereby they have been held captive, also universities. Uh, so they, they have been held captive by uh, extremely talented and dubious hackers that have got this information. And of course, the uh, agency that it's been stolen from uh, results in, in paying money to get it back, but we never know whether or not they we give it all back or whatever. So I guess my final question is, what does the city of Toronto have in place uh, to the best of your ability who, to counter this or to realize it is a threat? So uh, I just like to know what kind of, what kind of, uh, I guess, infrastructure you have or uh, to be able to thwart this or manage this because obviously uh, a breach of uh, personal information would not bode well for all of us. Thank you. Um, Ashley, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's definitely something that uh, many people are concerned about, you know, both the, um, uh, you know, sort of the hacking of the personal information as well as systems being held captive, right? Another way of cyber, cyber attack. So you're absolutely right on both fronts. Um, the city has created the Office of Information Security Officer in January 2020, and that office has been rapidly doing some great work in this area, uh, building on the existing work, of course. So, which is one of the reasons that we added in, um, you know, um, the the we, we have the principle around privacy and security, and as you probably have already gathered from our our presentation so far, you know we're not about creating new things necessarily than just building and strengthening uh, existing processes in 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 the city. So. We are working closely with our colleagues um, in the office of the uh, um, the cybersecurity and um, uh, side, and uh, they are the experts on this, <laughs> you know. Um, and so we will follow their lead and work up together with them to ensure that all these policies uh, work together um, in a cohesive way. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. To ask questions, Liv. Hi, thank you so much for this. Um, I'm wondering if you guys, I'm, I suspect you have looked at other jurisdictions uh, quite a bit. I'm a little bit familiar with the San Francisco um, digital equity um, plan and they have 
a 10 year plan. It's not as robust on accessibility actually, but one interesting thing that they do is they have a city um, run and sponsored digital equity summit. I don't know if it's every year or every or bi biannual or, or what it is, but to uh, both keep up with changing times, but also to continue the engagement uh, beyond the design process into feedback about implementation and ongoing new things that come up. Um, so I'm wondering if you've had a, a look at that or if you have any plans for ongoing engagement um, uh, as part of your process. Um, we have taken a look at a few different cities. Um, Seattle comes to mind as well for digital equity. Um, Salt Lake City has a great one as well. Um, lots of great examples to learn from. And, and of course, we're as we're planning out that work, um, the plan is definitely to, to keep engagement, especially in this space where um, things seem to be changing every day, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, we part of the digital infrastructure plan work and the consultation is to um, find the best way to keep the public engaged and to find the best way to um, to have that advisory function going into the city process continuously. So absolutely, um, the uh, sort of the cadence is yet to, to be determined, um, but um, that's part of the work that we're gonna be doing shortly. Um, Nabil? Yeah, um, hi everyone. Just to add to uh, to what Alice was saying, to be very specific and clear, there has been a community advisory group that has been guiding the development of the digital infrastructure plan over the last two years. Uh, and we have a, a meeting coming up with them uh, in just under two weeks. And we're currently also trying to think about what that role, and that'll actually be a question that we put to the group. What role do you want to continue playing over the next, you know, uh, you know, over the next year, two years, as the digital infrastructure plan is, is consulted, but and what role um, should the public have in general? So I just wanted to be identify that in particular. But I think uh, I'll also say that you know uh, we would, and this is one of the questions that Hamish identified. We've identified a number of groups that we'd like to consult uh, specifically as they relate to accessibility issues, and we're happy to uh, to reach out to more if you can identify if there's anyone that can be identified. Okay, uh, thank you very much for those answers and questions. Uh, to speak. Anyone to speak? Uh, Michelle, go ahead, please. Then Wendy, Michelle first. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and thank you, Alice and Hamish. We really appreciate the presentation and as well, you coming to us with thoughtful questions ahead of time. That's really always helpful. Um, there were a few points that you made around when and how to engage the public, um, access and equity considerations, and opportunities to shape the digital domain. So I just wanted to speak a bit to an experience I had when I was working on uh, website development um, for people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Uh, and I just wanted to stress the importance of the user experience or UX testing that we did, um, because obviously, Addressing barriers to accessing tech are hugely important and it's, it's great to see that that's happening, but it's also really important to consider equity and access by using the tech um, once everyone has equitable access. Um, so we found when we were doing this testing that uh, people that were tech savvy or weren't uh, still faced a lot of barriers. Um, we were an organization that supports people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, you know, we saw we were developing um, this website in tech that was really straightforward and intuitive, but of course, um, once you actually hear directly from people with intellectual and developmental disability, you find things you thought were straightforward, not so much. Um, so I just wanted to really encourage not only connecting with community partners and agencies, but hearing directly from people with intellectual disabilities and, and a variety of disabilities. I know uh, Michael can speak to uh, deafblind community and the needs there. So that was really just my point um, that engaging agencies is great, but you're really not going to make the experience more accessible or equitable unless you're speaking directly with people with disabilities and getting their input. Michelle, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Wendy. Thank you. Uh, really important points that you're making, Michelle. I hardly agree. Um, that, you know, not everybody who is disabled is connected to an agency and we forget that. So really direct uh, community connection is important. 
and particularly folks with developmental disabilities were often left out of these conversations, right, uh, around technology and how it works for them. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit to uh, the AI components of our discussion, and I was really heartened to hear you uh, acknowledge the kind of biases that are inherent in the algorithmic, um, the algorithms that are used by AI in lots of contexts. And in particular, I'm sure you're aware that they are, they can be biased against disabled people in particular. So um, what tends to happen is for disabled people, because there are so few of us, uh, we tend to get pushed to the edges of any of the kind of algorithmic analyses that are undertaken. And so our, our input and our, our actual visibility becomes uh, compromised, you know, and so decisions can be made about communities where disabled people are actually relegated to the, to the edges of the, of the pool. So uh, I just wanted to mention that perhaps it would be useful uh, to have an explicit statement or position on um, AI use and where, you know, it's, it's good to have the public registry around how it's being used, but also some positions on how it cannot be used. So what are the contexts in which AI should not be applied and what are the reasons for that? I think that would be really helpful too, in terms of transparency, but also just around ensuring again, that this community is not um, lost, that the kind of highly identifiable characteristics of this community do not exclude them from uh, from decisions where they should be present and do not make them more visible in decisions where maybe they shouldn't be as visible. Uh, on this work in particular, I'd recommend uh, connecting with, and I don't know if they're on your list, but the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University. Um, so Yuta Trevoranis is uh, the director of the center. And in fact, I'm a member of a project that's being undertaken there currently called We Count. Uh, yeah, so you're connected to the We Count project. We count is looking specifically at these questions around uh, digital um, privacy and around the biases involved in AI as it relates to disabled. If they're not on your list, then please let me know and I'd be happy to introduce you. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy, for those comments. Anyone else to speak? Uh, thank you. I'm going to move that we receive the the, uh, the staff presentation to thank staff for coming before the committee. I, I want to leave you with a few comments to your questions uh, with respect to additional statements or enhancements that could reinforce the policy. Um, I do believe there's a conversation and a debate emerging in, in this in this sector regarding uh, Wi-Fi or broadband or internet as a basic right or a human right. And I think that this has been um, talked about at the United Nations, has been talked about in, in Europe, and I don't think I've necessarily have seen the, the words in Canada follow with actions, and oftentimes action means you know, significant uh, investments, or working with the, the, the very large telecommunications companies to bridge that digital divide. A strong statement that says the City of Toronto is going to provide uh, universal internet access uh, to all residents would be a very strong enhancement uh, to the statement. I don't think it would be significant at this point in time, or enough, I should say, it would be insufficient to, to just say we'd like to have more access or that we want to include more people. We have to set a strong and bold visionary goal and then try to uh, do everything we can to achieve that. If we fall short, we'll regroup. It means that we'll have to look at the budget, we'll have to you know, shore up more additional uh, digital infrastructure investment, but we need to declare it and we need to own it and wrap ourselves around that statement. And COVID-19, I think, has, has clearly demonstrated to, to everyone how essential broadband Wi-Fi internet access is. Um, and, you know, whether we, we provide access to every single home, I know that's a very tall order, but at the very minimum, we should make all our facilities, city-owned and operated facilities, uh, enabled for Wi-Fi uh, public access. That, to me, is not a, a, a tall order. That is something that is, I believe, very achievable, um, and, uh, and that's something that we should strive for. So, so my, my recommendations is twofold, a strong, bold, strong statement that grounds itself in basic human rights, and then secondly, a budget that, and we know budgets are the apex of all policy tools, a budget that drives to that outcome. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion to receive the report? 
Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. We are heading on to, and we've got half an hour left before we break for lunch, and I think we can probably... Oh, actually, there is a... I've, I proceeded so quickly that I forgot to ask for a motion to receive item number four. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. Um, and item number four, just so you know what you voted on, was regarding the parking requirements. Okay, so we're heading very quickly to the end of the meeting. Uh, we have a presentation still regarding employment accessibility at the City of Toronto. Welcome, Holly. Uh, you've got 10 minutes, Holly Farah, to present to our committee. Um, we apologize for, for putting a little bit of a squeeze on you, uh, but your, your work is important and, and the work of the subject matter is very important to this committee. So please proceed when you're ready. Thank you. I'm going to actually defer to Alma um, Akintan to just give the opening remarks. Go ahead, Alma. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Alma Kinton. I'm the City of Toronto's Chief People Officer for those who are joining us this morning using a screen reader. I am a Black woman in my early 40s. My pronouns are she and her. And um, I, I have the pleasure of working with Holly and the team. And it's a pleasure. Oh, we were here a couple of years ago to give an update on the work that we were doing around employment accessibility. And this is another update. Um, and I hope that it will demonstrate the progress that we've made and the work that we we intend to do to move this um, move this work forward. So, I, in the interest of time, I will defer um, pass back over to Holly to do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Amla, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Amla said, my name is Hallie, and those of you who are reading uh, screen reader users, I am also a slim-figured black woman in her late 30s. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the manager of the city's corporate diversity and inclusion team within our people and equity division. So today in our presentation, if we can just move over to the next slide, um, we are on our presentation on employment accessibility at the City of Toronto. We aim to report back on our employment related motions that focus both on employment accessibility as well as the employee experience. In this report back, we will provide you with an update on specific recruitment tactics used on different disability communities. We'll speak to how we have explored opportunities to better support access to employment for persons with disability, as well as give you an update on our persons with disability employment strategy. And regarding the employee experience, we will give you an update on the efforts in place to inform staff with disability of their employment rights and the supports available. For some background, uh, we all know that the city as an organization has a commitment to reflect the communities we serve and live in. This commitment is aligned to our workplace culture uh, themes and the council adopted force and equity and inclusion plan which as we know is public and highlights the city's commitment to building a public service that reflects the population we serve and a city that values and champions diversity, accessibility, inclusion, and respect respectful behavior. To further support this work and address the gaps identified impacting people with disability, we also have a targeted strategy to address employment for persons with disability. There are three key focus areas on our employment accessibility strategy. And this includes, one, building a compelling value proposition to attract people with disabilities at all levels of the organization and encouraging self-identification and highlighting the benefits of disclosure, a value proposition that's centered around belonging. Like the city we live in, we strive to create an organization that fosters a culture that's equitable, accessible, and inclusive, a culture that encourages all staff to bring their full and authentic self forward. Second one is leveraging recruitment and retention best practices to develop a sustainable and intentional people with disability talent programming by ensuring that our hiring policies and practices are accessible. And finally, partnering with both internal stakeholders and external organizations to cultivate recruitment training programs and initiatives. For our strategic framework, um, on the next slide, we have a graphic that includes five of the following elements, planning, attraction and retention, workforce development, workforce engagement, and data integration. These five elements are centered on the candidate experience on the front end, and on front end of the process and the employee experience, which speaks to our retention framework. I will elaborate on each element on the next couple of slides as we update you on our strategic direction. 
an important theme of our strategic direction is to do this work collaboratively by engaging both internal um, partners for recruitment and retention strategies. This means ongoing partnership within the People and Equity Division to better understand the city's divisional needs and opportunities for promoting recruitment and retention of people with disabilities. It means working strategically with our employee with disability network to understand what the staff experience is for those of us who have disability. And also means working with our disability management team to understand accommodation related inquiries in all stages of the candidate, as well as the employee experience. As we work to improve uh, access to employment for persons with disability, our efforts focus on implementing recruitment and retention best practices by reviewing benchmark results uh, of companies that are leading in the recruitment and retention of people with disability. Another strategic direction is enhanced branding for talent attraction. This means developing an employee value proposition, again, centered around belonging, but with specific benefits to people with disability. It also means enhance, working on enhancing our city's job opportunities website to showcase the city's commitment to hiring persons with disability, creating social media campaigns and strategy that includes the employee uh, features and stories of those with disability. It all, an important step is also maximizing external partnerships by establishing relationships with new community-based organiz uh, diversity organizations that support the employment of persons with disability and continuously identifying and participating in people with disabilities recruitment events uh, throughout the year to source candidates and doing this with, uh, by identifying staff with disability as champions to attend these uh, events as brand ambassadors. And finally, as part of our workforce engagement to enable internal champions, we identify training opportunities for recruitment staff and people managers. As we know, these individuals are the gatekeepers of talent within organizations. So we engage them in expanded targeted training. As well, we also in citywide engagement uh, initiative and awareness uh, for, uh, for persons with disability, learning initiative and training to uh, create an inclusive workplace. And doing all this again by leveraging data from our applicant tracking system, as well as internal data from our Count Yourself and survey to support evidence-based decision-making and accountability. Uh, so based on the city's past experience, as well as uh, the input that we've had from the disability community and other equity deserving groups, we've, had, we've taken a different approach in addressing the gaps and barriers to employment specifically impacting access to employment by investing in a full and diversity and inclusion team focused on workforce and equity. This team is fairly new. It was officially launched earlier this year. However, the work that the diversity and inclusion team is doing is not new for the city. What's new is the investment that the city has taken to expand resources to do this work, which gives us the opportunity to be more intentional, targeted in how we approach this work in a more strategic and holistic way. On this team, we ensure to have representation from the disability community with staff that's both, that have both the technical expertise in the space, as well as the lived experience as people with disability to lead our accessibility uh, talent or employment strategies. These targeted diversity and inclusion specialists have extensive experience in advocacy when it comes to employment for persons with disability and are focused on the attraction and increased representation of people with disability at the city, as well as retention of employees with disability with a concentrated effort on workforce engagement and workforce development. Another accomplishment since we've last met is our efforts on uh, when it comes to strategic external partnerships. Diversity-focused uh, partnership with both community organizations and academic institutions that we've developed to increase the attraction, sourcing, and selection of candidates from the disability community. On this slide, uh, there are images uh, of logos of a number of groups that we have engaged with, uh, such as RWA, Epilepsy Toronto, CNIB Foundation, McMaster University, Seneca College, just to name a few. Um, and through these partnerships, We've been able to demonstrate that we're hitting the cross disability community in a different way. For example, with York University, uh, we participated in a virtual employer meet and greet for students with disability. 
With RWA, we recently hired three individuals uh, into one of our division, individuals who all had um, either were on the autism spectrum or had disclosed to have intellectual disability. Uh, and we also participated in a webinar with Special Sterner on topics such as employment support for neurodiverse students. Uh, the discussion around in that webinar was around disclosure, accommodation for those uh, with cognitive and learning disability, as well uh, through social media outreach. We offered persons with disability virtual coffee chats to speak about employment, offer resume review, and talk about the city's recruitment and hiring processes. We did this all digitally as we moved our, our we, um, given the impact that our COVID, the COVID-19 um, has had on, 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 our, on our city as a whole. Uh, we have also been strategic in how we go to market and sourcing candidates from the disability community. With our online branding, um, our marketing collateral has been bolder which has successfully yielded uh, really strong candidates from the cross-disability community. As we continue to do this work and address the identified gaps affecting access to employment for, mem for members of the disability community, we plan on uh, continuing to develop key external partnerships with community organizations focused on employment for persons with disability. And this means working more closely and strategically with these community organizations, as well as our academic institutions. We um, plan on enabling our hiring managers and recruitment staff who are, again, as the gatekeeper of talent, by ensuring that they have the tools and resources required to champion equitable, uh, acceptable, and inclusive uh, practices and policies. We will do this by focusing on building the equity and inclusion capabilities through, tra through training and using data and metrics to hold city staff accountable, as well as assess and evaluate the effectiveness of these training initiatives. We plan also on understanding the employee experience by working more strategically with our employee with disability network to leverage the experience of existing staff with disability and creating awareness both internally and externally by encouraging our leaders to disclose and pro uh, providing engaging and effective training for all staff to debunk the myths and misconceptions that's associated with disability. And doing this by continuing to support, promote, and strategically engage with our Employee with Disability Network. We understand that this work is going to take us some time to fully implement. But over the next year, as we continue to build capacity and infrastructure and leverage the additional expertise that we have in our corporate diversity and inclusion team, we plan on building the strong foundation needed to ensure that our efforts are sustainable. For the remainder of 2021, we will focus on building a, st a strong connection both internally and externally and ensuring that uh, the completion of the foundational and mandatory training across the Toronto Public Service. In Q1, we, uh, next year, we will focus on building the city's brand to attract people with disabilities. And we'll do this by, engage, uh, by getting out there, participating in initiatives, both on, on a digital platform and online, as well as in person uh, within the cross-disability community and within with our academic institutions. In Q2, we plan on focusing on workforce engagement. This means increasing awareness internally and working with our Employee with Disability Network on tailored engagement activities for staff with disability, as well as educational initiatives, destigmatize disability and encourage disclosure. And finally, in Q4, we will target workforce development, another retention strategy to impact career mobility and the development of employees with disability. When it comes to employee representation, the city uses the Count Yourself In survey. The survey allows us to obtain accurate, up to date, up to, uh, accurate data in the Toronto Public Service to determine our public uh, service is reflective of the population in the communities we serve. Based on, based on the most recent Count Yourself and data, 5% of our employees disclose to having one or more disability. It's important to note that participation in this survey is completely voluntary and not all Toronto Public staff take part in this survey. Efforts are under, underway to increase participation. When it comes to the employee experience and staff awareness on, uh, when it, for employment rights, the city strives to ensure that potential and new employees are made aware of their rights whenever possible. 
Currently, the city provides information and instructions for applicants about their rights, about the accommodation process, as well as our hiring and application process, as demonstrated in some of the activities that we have engaged in online. We also provide information and instructions for new employees about key policies and resources. And during our corporate onboarding efforts for new employees at the city, we highlight key policies. If we just move over to the next slide. We highlight key policies um, about employee rights and protection, uh, policies around our corporate access and privacy, for instance, uh, and many more that are listed on this slide. We also highlight mandatory training through ELI, which includes um, topics around accessibility one-on-one, -on -one, our hu your human rights uh, topics, uh, and many more. We also provide links to unions and associations so that employees are aware of their rights and the right to access and join these associations. We also provide workplace and wellness resources, uh, links to our equity and human rights uh, offices, links to our um, employee assistance programs, leave policies, and other relevant um, um, policies. So this brings us to an end and a wrap on our report back on employment accessibility. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present to you. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was certainly a lot of great information. Um, and uh, I can see that lots has happened since you've, uh, you've been here at last. Um, are there any questions uh, to the staff uh, regarding their presentation to clarify? Yeah, uh, first to, uh, to question is Wendy. Thank you for the great presentation. There's been a ton of work that's happened. I think that's really excellent. Um, I wondered if you could just clarify for me uh, what you mean by um, disclosure? Uh, so, you know, it, it's referred to in several places in terms of the presentation, encouraging people to disclose, and um, a little bit of additional information about why I'm asking. So, uh, I think that, you know, disclosure of disclosure needs to be very carefully considered, right, in this context, because uh, just encouraging people to disclose to no end is not a useful thing, I don't think. Um, and I think maybe what you mean is accommodations, like using, you know, making use of the available accommodations that are there. But I, I just want to clarify, if you could. Thanks. That's a great question, Wendy. Um, I'll start off and then I'll, I'll, I'll lean on the rest of my colleagues. So it's both. As mentioned in our presentation, disclosure when it comes to the data that we collect. So at the front end, we do collect the data on our applicant tracking system. So disclosing there really helps us look at some of the pain points within our processes. And once you come in, um, disclosing within the survey, the count yourself in survey, as well as um, in our conversations with, 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 with candidates, of course, there's that piece around disclosing on when you need accommodation. So it's really disclosure as, you know, in, I think it's two tiers. Disclose what you need to, when you need to, of course, absolutely, but also um, impacting our data to make sure that, that we, we have enough data to really leverage and, and ensure that our processes are equitable. Thanks, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I have a, a quick question. Uh, where do you want, are, are there benchmarks that the city is trying to achieve? Um, just because I, I see a lot of great work being developed, and obviously that's about creating, you know, a, a stronger Toronto Public Service that's aware of those issues. You're making accommodations, but is there a, is there a goal? Would there be an ideal number? And, and sometimes those goals do help us achieve them when we know what we're, what we're aiming for. It's Amma, I'm happy to help with that. I mean, ultimately our prime, one of our goals, and this is a goal that council has long um, aspired to, is for us to reflect the diversity of the population that we serve. So we know that the disability community makes up 10 to 12% of our population. So we certainly want to at least get there. 
as a, as a baseline and then keep working from there. But really, we in, we know that people face barriers across um, with different employers. So our goal is to be an employer of choice. So you heard Hallie talk a lot about branding, that while other organizations are kind of maybe still struggling to get there, we want to make ourselves as open as possible. So if it's 15%, that we would be happy for that. But at the very least, we want to reflect the diversity of the population we serve. And, this, and with that, so that the target is always changing as we get better census data. So that is the benchmark. Thank you, Alma. And I guess uh, within the trial public service, obviously, there's many divisions, uh, many different skills and, and qualifications are required um, of, of, of all our employees. And have you seen some divisions be ready to accept and embrace this change that you're bringing forward uh, more than others? And uh, and can you provide us who are the who are the thought leaders, which divisions, and which divisions are lagging behind? I will say, in working with our division, that there has been a really keen interest in this area from across the enterprise. Um, one of the divisions that I would say, you know, I would share a success story is our engineering and consulting services. This is a division that came to us and, and, and identified a gap and really wanted to focus on this community, specifically with those with neurodiverse, uh, in the neurodiversity uh, demographic. Um, so I would say, yes, there's a keenness across, uh, across the organization, but if I had to pick one that I, I would share a success story, and the ones that recently hired the three resources um, from with RWA, it be our engineering and construction services. Thank you. And are you getting equal uptake? I'm, I'm not trying to put a too fine of a point on it, but I, I recognize that there will probably be some divisions that are doing better than others. But are you getting, are you saying that you're getting equal uptake, equal level of enthusiasm across the enterprise, or are there some that just need a, a little bit more of a nudge, more of work? I would say. I would say when it comes to workforce equity as a whole, there's an equal interest across the organization. And once we engage with these uh, divisional leads, then we have a conversation on which, where, which segments to focus on. Um, with the new resources that we have on our diversity and inclusion team, there's a lot more conversation around um, uh, tapping into this, into this community for sure. Thank you. And with this, is, I have one final question. Uh, with respect to the, um, the the count and the employee count of who's identifying and, and which where they're going, um, which division is leading with respect to recent or, or full-on hires of people living with disabilities? Do you have that information handy? I'm going to have to take that back. I don't have that information handy. I can take that back and maybe so we. It's so much. So we do have that data. We just don't have it on hand. So what we do with the count yourself in survey over the last few years is we actually meet with each of the division heads to go over their data and to identify what the gaps are for them. So we can certainly through that identify who who might be leading. But I think Hallie's right. I've certainly had conversations with people across the organization, and there is a keen interest in doing more work in this space. And so. Um, some keener than others, but everyone keen. I can't point to one division that is not at all interested. Okay, thank you. You know, I do have one final question, and that's regarding budget uh, allocations for accommodations. Does that come out of a, the general account, uh, sorry, the general budget, operating budget of that division, or is it a global um, uh, budget that everyone can draw from, but it's not out of that specific division? And the reason for the question is sometimes if, if they have to, if it costs more to provide accommodations, uh, then they then they they may be de de deterred from hiring people with disabilities. Thank you. I'm happy to take that question. So through the effort of TAC last session last um, last year, we now have a centralized budget. So the way the process works is that it is it is um, divisional budgets that pay for accommodation, but there is now a pot of money that divisions can also tar um, tap into, and that's an initiative that was, it was a motion that was um, passed by TAC and then approved by exec and council, and so we now have a budget to supplement. Thank you. I think the TAC members are happy. <laughs> They see that their, their motions do have significant effect. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of our questions. Uh, anyone to speak? Otherwise, I will move to receipt, just looking at the time. 
Uh, Wendy, go ahead, please. Wendy, can you also move to receive? I, then? I don't. Yes, I, I will move to receive this. Um, but I just wanted to say, uh, StatsCan does look at the number of people with disabilities in Canada, and in 2017, they said it was 22% of the population. So it's a little bit higher than 15, 10 to 15%. Just to mention that in the context of when you are setting goals around the these kinds of considerations that actually the numbers are even higher usually than what you think. So, um, but I, I do wanna say well done to everybody in terms of all of the work that you've developed here. And uh, it's fantastic as, as uh, Councillor Wontem was saying to see that, you know, sometimes what we talk about at the TAC turns into something that can support moving all of this forward too. It's really heartening to see that. Uh, I wanted to just speak briefly to my question around disclosure um, and just a little bit on it. You know, I, I think it's very important, as you say, for people to disclose in terms of the data collection strategies that you have, because the 55% is much lower than what we have been told by StatsCan is the constitution of people with disabilities in the community. So clearly that is an important piece. Um, Coming from working with people living with HIV in the community, just caution around disclosure because sometimes what people take disclosure to mean is I'm going to tell you what my um, condition is, that disclosure automatically rolls into an understanding of like, I'm going to tell you all about my medical history. And really what, what I think is uh, important and um, fitting for this context outside of your survey where you're not obviously asking about diagnoses either, I would imagine, is uh, do you need any kind of an accommodation, right? What, what do you need in terms of the work that you're doing to be able to do it um, better? Uh, and just to nuance that, I think is really important in terms of the communications around employment and what disclosure in the context of employment means. But it does not mean that you have to tell everybody what you're, and in, in recruitment too, because actually you will get people who will come to interviews and think, okay, they said to disclose, now I've got to tell them you know, exactly what my medical condition is which is not a requirement, in fact, puts people in a vulnerable position, right? So anyway, I just wanted to add that and say thank you very much. It's obvious that there's been a lot of work done here, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, anyone else to speak? Uh, seeing none, then with our thanks and uh, one motion on the floor, uh, all those in favor to receive the presentation, any opposed? That carries. Uh, thank you very much, staff. That was wonderful. That's great work. Uh, we'll look forward to welcoming you again. Okay, we have one last item, and this is a letter from Michael McNeely. Uh, Michael, do you want to speak to the item that's before us? And uh, oh, and there is a recommendation from staff to um, provide a slight change to your uh, motion that allows for a second quarter rep report back to tax. So therefore, we can try to round it out. And I can also, if uh, if do you do you need do you have it, Michael? If not, uh, not to worry. You could move your motion on the move your the, the recommendation in your letter, and then I can also just amend it. Uh, the the staff do, do have it ready, so you can speak to the the letter itself. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the caption in to catch up. Um, so, would you like me to read the letter out loud? Uh, if, if you don't need to read the whole letter, but if you want to just read your speak to the recommendation. Okay, I will speak to the recommendation. Um, so, I have had concerns about the likelihood of people with disabilities becoming affected in public housing as a result of um, not having their accommodation needs met. And um, from my understanding, it turns out that the police are involved when, um, when people are affected. And I want to first, I think what I'm proposing is to do a multi-motion approach to this because I have other motions that I do want to implement, but this would be the first of a few. And this would be looking at the police oversight of those evictions. And so I want to see if the police are factoring in 
the accommodation needs of the people that are being evicted. And if they're not, what can be done about that? And if they are, how well are those accommodations being insured? And, you know, um, it was brought to my attention that, you know, we may not have legislative power or governmental power to look at what the police are doing, but I think it would be a good approach to just try and see what happens to to request the the information that I am requesting in my letter. Um, and part of this is a personal reason why I'm putting this about is because it was brought to my attention that several members of the deafblind community are facing evictions from public housing as a result of um, a lack of sanitation regarding their properties. But the the reason why there's a lack of sanitation and a bug, uh, bed bug infestation with cockroaches and stuff is because nobody has been able to go into those apartments as a result of COVID and as a result of a lack of accommodations to help those people. So it's a catch-22 situation. You've been evicted, but you've been evicted because you're not having your accommodation needs met. And I feel like this is a gross uh, human rights violation. And so I would appreciate um, all of your support to look into this matter with me. Michael, thank you for your, your comments and, and also for placing the, uh, the letter before us. I think it's a very timely uh, question that you raise and obviously it requires uh, some additional work. Um, I want to just, uh, I, the, the clerks have provided me with a motion uh, to amend, just very friendly amendment to your recommendation number two. Uh, and the recommendation is that we have the general manager of shelter support housing administration in consultation with the general manager of social development finance and administration and the executive director of the housing secretariat and relevant divisions to report back to this committee by the second quarter of 2022. So basically it's just inserting a, a report back date. So your the work that you've you've asked doesn't get lost into the black hole of, of motions uh, and so that we can hopefully see some outcome. So I hope you can consider that as a friendly amendment. And are there Yes I think that's helpful. Okay. I think that is helpful. I do appreciate the support of everyone because I think we all agree that this is an important uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, after we get this information, there will probably be more motions originating from the information that we get. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Um, I don't believe there are any other speakers to this matter. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? And then the item as amended? All those in favor, indicate your support. Any opposed? Uh, that carries. Thank you so much. So this is such an efficient committee. Uh, we've come to the very end. One last bit, bit of business. Uh, I move that the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee excuse the absence of Bhuvani Sigva Nananam Sundaram from the September 2nd, 2021 Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting. All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? That carries. Okay, very timely closure. We were just about to lose our captioner, but it just is perfect. 12.30, right on the dot, we're coming to a close. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. This was a fantastic meeting. So much did we cover uh, the 